Now a hearing on USAID to Colombia. Today, National Drug Control Policy Director Barry McCaffrey was among those testifying before a House Government Reform Subcommittee. During this portion, you'll also hear from other drug enforcement officials. It's just over four and a half hours. Good morning. I'd like to call this uh, hearing of the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy and Human Resources uh, to order. Today, uh, our topic is the United States response to the crises in Colombia. And uh, we'll start uh, today's proceeding with uh, opening statements of my members. We have uh, three uh, panels to hear from today. so. We'll move uh, forward and hopefully be joined by some of our other colleagues uh, in the uh, next few minutes. With those comments, uh, let me first uh, make my opening statement. Today, uh, this House subcommittee will examine the United States' response to the growing crisis in Colombia. We'll take this opportunity to review the administration's track record of delivering resources, including previously authorized counter drug aid and equipment to Colombia, as well as examine the current Colombian aid proposal. Uh, this hearing will serve as the first real public airing of the issue since the administration submitted its billion dollar plus emergency supplemental aid package. Our hemisphere in the United States are facing one of the greatest challenges to its national security as the situation in Colombia continues to deteriorate. Left unchecked, the narco-terrorist threat in Colombia will continue to spiral out of control, threatening Latin America's oldest democracy and leading to regional instability. As the illegal drug trade continues to grow, it fuels narco-terrorism, it undermines legitimate government institution, and it leads to increasing violence in the region. The impact of this destabilization in the region will have a devastating impact on the United States' national security interests. After years of pleading and pressure by House members and members of Congress, I appreciate that finally this, the administration has submitted to Congress a Colombian aid pr uh, proposal which just has uh, arrived. It arrived seven months after General McCaffrey sounded the alarm calling the situation in Colombia an emergency and four months after the Pastrana government submitted Plan Colombia asking for United States assistance. Because the United States response has been slow to assist Colombia in combat combating narco-terrorism, that country now supplies 80 percent, some 80 percent of the world's cocaine. This explosion in coca cultivation from Peru and Bolivia to Colombia has occurred in just the past four or five years. The explosion in poppy cultivation in Colombia is equally disturbing and even uh, more recent than uh, what we've seen with uh, coca. Through the DEA's heroin signature program, we know that Colombia, not the Far East, accounts for some 75% of the heroin seized on U.S. streets. We've got a chart up here that, uh, that does uh, denote that. And from the signature program, uh, they can identify almost to the fields uh, where that uh, heroin is uh, uh, coming from, the source of it. Several years ago, Colombia grew only enough poppies to fill a flower arrangement. What used to be a supply of hard drugs being processed and transited through Colombia has turned into a torrent and glut of deadly narcotics pouring across our borders. Both drugs and the death that accompany drugs are spilling onto our shores. And American blood also has been spilled on Colombian soil. 
Last summer, five American men and women from the U.S. Army were killed in the line of duty in Colombia when their United States reconnaissance plane crashed into a mountain on a counter-drug mission into, uh, which, was, which took place in narco-guerrilla territory. This marks the first time in U.S. history that American military personnel have been killed in action in Colombia's drug war. In addition to these five Americans, three U.S. contract pilots have been killed in Colombia over the past two years. Three Americans were abducted and brutally murdered by the FARC, which is Colombia's largest group of drug trafficking uh, guerrillas. And that took place earlier uh, this year. And numerous Americans have been kidnapped by Colombian uh, narco guerrillas. In fact, the longest held U.S. hostages are three American missionaries uh, from my district, which have been unaccounted for since 1993. In short, despite years of congressional pleas for counter-drug assistance to Colombia, countless hearings and intense congressional efforts, resources approved by Congress have failed to be provided to Colombia. Someone must be held accountable for the disaster that's now at our doorstep. Time and again, the Clinton administration has ignored the emerging situation in Colombia despite con congressional oversight hearings that have tried repeatedly to call attention to the, uh, the impending crisis. In short, despite years of congressional pleas for assistance to Colombia, countless hearings and intense congressional efforts, resources approved by Congress have failed even uh, after all of that to be provided to Colombia. To borrow a phrase, uh, the, re the record is a flipping disaster. First, information uh, sharing was denied, and, and, and let's just take a quick second to look at how we got in this, this situation. First, information sharing was denied in 1994, turning the situation into, co to, into sheer chaos, chaos as, as my colleague from uh, California, Steve Horn, so aptly described. As you'll recall, uh, as of May 1st, 1994, the Department of Defense decided unilaterally to stop sharing real-time intelligence regarding aerial traffic and drugs with both Colombia and Peru. Now, as I understand it, that description, which hasn't been completely resolved, has thrown diplomatic relations with host countries into chaos. That was a comment and a hearing uh, by Congressman Steve Horn August 2nd, 1994, and I put that up for the uh, subcommittee to review. In 1996 and 1997, when this administration decertified Colombia without a national interest waiver, it sever severely undermined the legitimate drug fighting efforts of General Sol Serrano and the Colombian National Police, cutting off international mi military education training uh, and critical equipment to that country. Even worse today, the absence of U.S. intelligence sharing, due in part to the reduced air coverage after the forced closure of Howard Air Force Base in Panama, our drug uh, counter efforts in the uh, region have been further crippled. Uh, we held a hearing on this GAO report, and I think it was quite enlightening to see that uh, even pleas by the uh, United States ambassador uh, from Peru uh, asking that, uh, in fact, uh, the surveillance flights be uh, uh, kept up and also uh, warning that uh, if we didn't uh, participate, that, in fact, we would see uh, more hero uh, I'm sorry, more cocaine coming out of uh, Peru uh, and uh, also out of uh, Colombia. In fact, that prediction in 98 ha has come true because, uh, in fact, uh, we, we have not paid attention to the requests even of officials of this administration who are on the front line. While very publicly calling for $1.6 billion in emergency aid last month at the White House, this administration requested only $85 million in State Department INL funding for Colombia in the fiscal year 2000. The Congress passed a supplemental aid package to increase the funding for counter-narcotics work in Colombia. 
Sadly, less than half of the equipment Congress funded in that bill has been delivered uh, uh, in an operational fashion. In fact, uh, we found up till the just a few weeks ago uh, that uh, the three helicopters, which account for the uh, the bulk of uh, aid dollars, when finally delivered, sat idle for lack of uh, proper armoring or ammunition. Uh, the the uh, headline that's put up there is interesting because uh, that's not the headline from a, a few weeks ago. This is a headline from 1998 Washington Times delay of helicopters hobbles Columbia and stopping drugs. And as I said, uh, we've been trying for years to get this equipment uh, online uh, in a real uh, war on drugs. Uh, we find ourselves in the same situation when we can't get three helicopters uh, to uh, Columbia with proper armoring and ammunition even in the last uh, few months. Uh, another story that appeared in the paper, and again, I haven't confirmed this, but I'm told that it's certain that the ammunition we asked to get to Columbia was delivered during the uh, uh, during the holidays uh, to the loading docks of the State Department. Uh, it appears that, uh, unfortunately, we have a gang that can't shoot straight or get the ammunition to shoot straight uh, uh, to Columbia where it's needed. This administration, unfortunately, has resisted congressional efforts to ensure that needed drug fighting equipment makes it to Columbia in a timely manner. This administration has fought the Congress for years on Black Hawk utility helicopters for the Colombian National Police, and unfortunately has a pathetic track record of delivering the assistance. And I've shown, uh, again, that we're, we're back here looking at uh, trying to get these resources to where we know they're needed. Unfortunately, nearly half of the $954 million uh, that uh, is provided in the supplemental aid package for Columbia is for 30 Black Hawk helicopters for the Colombian military, again, uh, which we requested uh, years and years ago uh, to be online uh, in Colombia to fight this battle. Given the high cost of these assets and the poor tra delivery track record of the uh, State Department, I'm concerned about committing this amount of money to a program that has not worked well in the past. As chairman of this subcommittee, I want to ensure that the final aid package contains funds for programs that have a proven track record of success. And also, we figure out some way to get uh, this equipment there in a timely fashion. There are reports of increased activity by the 17,000 Marxists narco-terrorist guerrillas, also known as the FARC. This army of insured insurgents controls nearly 40 percent of the Colombian countryside. The FARC and the ELN are heavily financed by drug traffickers, with an estimated $600 million coming directly or indirectly from illicit drug trade. The FARC army has gone largely unchecked and is now expanding beyond Colombia's borders. I'm deeply concerned about reports of FARC incursions into neighboring countries. The basic tenet of the administration's aid package is to use the Colombian military and the police to push into southern Colombia. I'm also concerned that we do not allow the drug traffickers to simply shift production operations to neighboring countries, especially those with non-secure borders like Ecuador, which is recently experienced domestic turmoil, and Panama. With the price of uh, coca leaf rising above the profitability level uh, in Peru and Bolivia, I'm also concerned that drug traffickers are not allowed to reactivate coca fields in those countries. We cannot afford to roll back years of successful eradication efforts in both Peru and Bolivia. One of the points that will be made in today's hearing is that Colombia matters. It matters both economically and strategically. The United States can ill afford further instability in that region. With 20 percent of the U.S. daily supply of crude and refined uh, oil imports coming from that area, 
And with the uh, vitally important Panama Canal located just 150 miles to the north, the national security and economic implications of Colombia's rebel activity spilling over into neighboring countries are enormous. For all these reasons, I believe the final aid package must have a balanced regional approach. This subcommittee will continue to play a key role in ensuring that the United States counter drug aid to, to Co Colombia is both sufficient, appropriate, and also that it, uh, those resources are delivered in a timely manner. I'm committed to uh, continued congressional oversight of this issue, both because I believe of the, the influx of illegal drugs to the United States is our greatest social <laughs> challenge, and also uh, we face an insidious national security threat from the situation there. I know that many of my colleagues share this concern. As we face this serious and growing challenge in Colombia, our vital national interests are undeniably at stake. The situation in Colombia requires immediate attention, but the nature and extent of United States aid needs to be carefully considered, especially in light of this administration's past track record. This hearing hopefully will shed light on the situation in Colombia as we hope as we help uh, frame the national debate on how to address the growing crisis. I'm pleased at this time to yield now to the ranking member of our subcommittee, the gentlelady from Hawaii, Mrs. Mink. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> for uh, your opening remarks, which I believe sets an appropriate tone for these hearings and for the congressional uh, discussions to follow. There is absolutely no doubt that there is a crisis in Colombia and that uh, the United States has a great responsibility in uh, addressing this particular crisis, particularly because of the drug issue. Colombia supplies 80 percent of the world's cocaine and uh, the DEA administration here in this country estimates that as much as 75 percent of the heroin that enters the United States originates in Colombia. Uh, the aid package uh, is a $1.6 billion total uh, for Colombia, and it is uh, the United States' response to requests from the Colombian government to <coughs> adopt its plan, which is basically to um, support the government's efforts in its own economic uh, development or redevelopment and uh, at the same time answer the tremendous uh, demands that the United States government has with respect to limiting the production and uh, transport of these dangerous drugs into the United States. I believe that it's important as we uh, consider and deliberate on this issue of this particular package of assistance to Colombia that we understand that there has been, in effect, a 35-year-old civil war in that country, which has killed 30,000 people and displaced over a million. We know that 40 percent of Colombia's territory is controlled by left-wing rebels. And the United States State Department, as well as human rights groups, have reported that paramilitary groups murder and kill civilians, largely because of their political beliefs. In my own uh, situation, I have to uh, uh, note that in February of 1999, one of my own constituents, Lahayanai Gay from the Big Island, was among three individuals who were brutally murdered. And so I come to this hearing with no small concern about uh, the situation in Colombia, the takeover by <coughs> Uh, rebels and guerrillas and other individuals making governance there uh, almost uh, impossible. But, Mr. Chairman, it's unlikely that this long-standing pattern of uh, civil war within Colombia can be changed by a $1.6 billion insertion of money, certainly not in the two years. It will probably require continued consideration by the Congress and continued allocation of funding. Our primary concern, of course, 
is the continued enormous increase of flow of illegal drugs into this country. That is the national security issue that we are attempting to address. If we provide aid primarily in the form of military equipment, military expertise, and military personnel, I believe it's naive to think that we will not become drawn deeper and deeper into the civil war unrest within this country. And therefore, we must consider the grave consequences to the United States of the introduction of increased numbers of U.S. service personnel who may become the next casualties in the Colombian civil unrest. Americans have a long-standing skepticism about intervention in other countries' civil wars. There have been notable exceptions in the interests of enforcing human rights abroad. The doctrine of non-intervention requires that we must be able to justify military action in terms of our national security interests. It's true that the insurgents are funding their military efforts with the cultivation and sale of illegal drugs, most of which comes to the United <coughs> States. But this does not obscure the fact that the support of the government of Colombia will, uh, in this way, with this type of uh, an aid package, draw us further and further into the internal uh, political situation of that country. I believe it would be more sensible for us to tilt the balance of aid to direct more funding to non-military purposes. If we were to assist the Colombian government in developing its economy and building a viable infrastructure so that the goods and commodities that are grown by the people of Colombia can reach the international markets, I believe we would be better able to answer the long-range problems of that country. While we, of course, support the Pastrana government, and I do so, I visited the area earlier in 1999, we have to remember that our primary interest of intervention in any form is the necessity to stop the production of cocaine and heroin and to prevent its introduction into the United States. We have to focus on this issue of uh, interdiction and also with the additional funds enhance our law enforcement activities within the United States. I'm pleased that we have a uh, very uh, important and distinguished array of witnesses who can add to this debate, and I will be here to listen to uh, their advice and uh, response to questions which we put to them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Now I'd like to recognize the chairman of our full committee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, uh, Chairman Mike. Uh, let me uh, uh, say that a lot of the things I was going to cover have been covered, so I'd like to submit my statement for the record and just make some uh, brief comments. First of all, let me just say that uh, the war in Colombia is our war as well as the Colombians. Every year, 14,000 Americans die from drugs and drug-related violence. And those drugs are coming mainly from Colombia. So it's not just their war, it's our war. In Baltimore, a councilman recently said that one out of eight, one out of eight of the citizens there is a drug addict. They also stated the, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration says that Baltimore has 45,000 heroin addicts. Now this is just one major city in the United States. So for anybody to say that this is not our war as well as uh, the Colombians, they're just not reading the statistics and the facts. People are dying in the United States as a result of the flood of drugs coming in from that part of the world. And we haven't been doing anything about it. We talked with General McCaffrey back in 1996 about three Black Hawk helicopters. We wanted to spend $36 million for those Black Hawks. And he said, well, we shouldn't be taking that money because uh, a lot of it was uh, supposed to go to Bolivia and Peru and, uh, and as a result, the Blackhawks uh, weren't sent. Congress has been talking about getting these Blackhawks down there for years. Uh, Denny Hastert, the Speaker of the House, uh, Chairman Gilman and myself, and Chairman Micah, have all been hollering to high heaven about the need to get those Blackhawks down there. 
and uh, we've run into opposition from the State Department. I'd like to read from a statement before Chairman Gilman's committee on February the 12th, 1998. Secretary Albright, Mr. Chairman, on that issue, let me say that I think there is some dispute as to whether those helicopters are needed or not. General McCaffrey, with whom I spoke just before I came to have breakfast with you, discussed this issue, and he believes they are not necessary. General McCaffrey said, February 1998, they are not necessary. And as I said, we have this budget of $230 million or so, and $50 million of that would have, have to be spent on the helicopters, and it would have a cascading effect on our drug programs throughout the world. Well, they are necessary. They were necessary. That was a miscalculation by the administration, and I think history will prove that. Now, I welcome the administration to this fight in Colombia. I appreciate that. I appreciate General McCaffrey stepping up to the table and saying, hey, it's time we did something. I only wish that we had started doing it earlier because, because we, we haven't done it earlier, it's going to cost more money now than it would have otherwise. And the surrounding countries are at risk. Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela has been stated, they're at risk as well. Now, the State Department and the, their subsidiary, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, the INL, they're charged with delivering most of the assistance to Colombia. And the State Department has not been doing its job. Just last week, uh, Mr. Beers, who's the INL Assistant Secretary, Mr. Beers informed uh, committee staff that the uh, standard floor armor armoring for the Black Hawk helicopters funded for the CNP did not fit. We sent three helicopters down there. We, we, we actually have six in the pipeline. Three of them were delivered. They've been sitting there for how long, Ben? A hundred days. They've been just sitting there for a hundred days. Well, they said they didn't have the proper armor on them. Well, they finally got the armor down there. It didn't fit. So they're still sitting there. Now, they've gone out on some missions and threatened and risked the lives of the people in the CNP without that armor. But that shouldn't be necessary. Once again, it was a screw-up over at the State Department. 50,000 rounds of ammunition were sent down there. 50,000 rounds of ammunition. The only problem with that ammunition was it was made in 1952 and it wouldn't work. So you got helicopters that they can't fly and ammunition they're sending down there that won't work. So they said, okay, we made a mistake. We're going to send them another 50,000 rounds of ammunition. And where did they send it? As Chairman Micah said, they sent it over to the State Department here in Washington. Now, I don't know how many machine guns they have over at the State Department, but they're not focused on Columbia. So we have screw-up after screw-up after screw-up, and we have the State Department saying we don't need those helicopters. Secretary Albright, I just talked to General McCaffrey. We don't need those helicopters down there. At the same time, the guerrillas are being well-funded by the drug cartel. They've been getting as much as $100 million a month. And the estimates of their force is between 17,000 and 30,000, and they're growing every single day. And, uh, you know, it's been stated, I think, here today that uh, we ought to be dealing with this from an economic standpoint, getting economic assistance down there. Well, I think that's, that's one of the things that needs to be done. But the fact of the matter is, appeasement is not going to work with those guerrillas. They started talking about a peace agreement not too long ago, and all the while they were talking about a peace agreement, they were involved in attacking cities surrounding the, the, the area they control. So you can't trust those guys. You have to deal with them from a position of strength. That means we have to get them the military assistance they need, and we have to get it down there to them as quickly as possible. Now, a lot of the things that uh, 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 is supposed to be in the pipeline has not yet been delivered. I don't have my figures right here in front of me, but uh, there's a lot of things that the, the Defense Department was supposed to get down there. that hasn't been sent. <clears throat> Aid not delivered or operational to Columbia. Three UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters, which I mentioned. Funding for operations and support for Columbia National Police Air Wing, $6 million. 
funds uh, that are programmed but not spent, procurement of mini gun systems and ammunition for Columbia National Police, 3.2 million. Things that are partially delivered, reconstruction of Miro Flores counter narcotics base, that was canceled, that's $2 million. Monies to be reprogrammed, security enhancements for forward located Columbia National Police bases, $6 million. And I can go on and on and on. There's a whole bunch here. Prodded, uh, a potted radio, radar for aircraft, reprogrammed, $5 million. DC-3 operating funds, $1 million. And there's a whole list of these things. We learned at our last hearing here, the subcommittee, there are still items from the 1997, 1998, and 1999 drawdowns, which I was just talking about, excess U.S. military equipment that has not been delivered to the CNP. Why haven't they been delivered? Well, probably because Secretary Albright had been told that it wasn't necessary for that stuff to be down there, like the helicopters. It is necessary. It should have been done previously. I'm glad it's being looked into and done now, better late than never. But we need to get on with it. And one other thing I'd like to say, the Dante forces down there, the part of the CNP that's been dealing with the, 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 the drug problem, have experience in this area. The proposal made by the administration is going to give one out of every $17 to the CNP and the rest of other agencies, mainly the Colombian military, which do not have the expertise. Now, General McCaffrey will probably tell us today that the CNP does not have the ability to get all around the country like the Army does. Well, they would have if we had gotten the materials down there to them earlier, the Blackhawks and other things, and that can still be done. In any event, we welcome the administration to this fight. Congress is not trying to micromanage. We're just trying to make sure the job gets done before we have to send American young men and women down there. We don't want that to happen. We don't need a war we're involved in in Central America. But if we don't do something about this situation rather quickly, we're going to have a big problem, and we may have to be involved. So let me just end up by saying I appreciate the administration seeing what needs to be done finally. We appreciate their participation, and I hope we get on with it as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to recognize now the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But with my voice the way it is, I think I'll wait for the question and answer period. Thank you. Right. Uh, can I go to Mr. Gilman, the chairman of our International uh, Relations Committee and also a member of our subcommittee? You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for today's hearing and keeping focus on the nation's drug policy, and we welcome our witnesses who will be here, and particularly General McCaffrey. These hearings and your continuous interest, Mr. Micah, in the vital issue of drug trafficking have helped keep the heat on our nation's policy, which has been notoriously slow to react to the threat which illicit drugs poses to our nation's security. Colombia, now the source nation, for more than 80% of the world's cocaine, and most recently, up to 75% of the heroin sold or seized on our streets, is a major national security concern, not only for our nation, but it should be similarly for the rest of the world as well. For years, many of us in the Congress have been urging the administration to pay attention to what's happening to our neighbor to the south. Colombia is now capable of producing more than 400 tons of deadly cocaine annually. That massive drug production capacity, along with Colombian drug lords' creative ability to market and to create demand for heroin here in our own nation, should be a wake-up call for both our nation and for Europe. It should set off an alarm throughout the globe for everyone truly concerned about the safety and security of our young people and communities from the scourge of illicit hard drugs originating in America's backyard. And we had good uh, uh, testimony the other day when you arranged that summit of world leaders uh, with regard to narcotics. And I was pleased that General McCaffrey was able to be there to hear uh, their concern as well as our own. The administration, which regrettably fought us tooth and nail a few short years ago, over just a few helicopters for the narco police to be able to eradicate the growing opium and coca leaf production in Colombia, fortunately is now sounding the alarm about the beleaguered Andean nation. 
And as Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter once said, and I quote, wisdom too often never comes, and one ought not to reject it merely because it comes late. Let us hope it isn't too late for the case of Colombia. We now welcome these serious concerns about Colombia and about our drug policy. Along with many of my colleagues in the Congress, particularly in this committee, we've raised similar concerns years ago when Colombia became a major player in the heroin business. And again in 97, when it first became the world's greatest coca leaf producer, exceeding Peru. We're pleased that General McCaffrey, our nation's drug czar, will be testifying this morning. General McCaffrey, we want to congratulate you on the new counter-narcotics intelligence sharing plan, which you announced yesterday at the White House, to improve coordination and information sharing. Hopefully, with the help of this new program, in the future we can avoid being caught off guard on developments like the Colombian heroin crisis we're now facing. Yesterday, General McCaffrey stated, and I quote, we have a drug emergency in Colombia. Support for the administration's plan is critical if we're going to be able to stop increased production in Colombia from outstripping gains made in the rest of the region. Now that we have admitted that the serious problem exists, we can start going about treating the cause in Colombia. President of Colombia recently on 60 Minutes hit the nail on the head on what the problem is. According to President Pastrana, the one million to two million dollars a day, one to two million a day, which the insurgency earns from drug trafficking, now threatens his nation's very survival as a democracy. Until recently, when Congress took the lead, we had only averaged less than $100 million to U.S. counter-narcotics aid to Colombia each year. That's equal to six weeks' income from the Colombian narco guerrillas. These massive amounts of illicit monies make them the best armed, the best trained, the best equipped guerrillas anywhere in the world with their war chests financed from the sale of drugs. Hopefully now the administration is getting serious and it needs to treat Colombia as a serious national security and regional threat. Several past presidents have called our drug crisis a national security threat. Only when we get this serious and when we give the courageous Colombians like General Jose Serrano and his anti-drug police, Adante, the means and the sustained support for their fight against drugs at the source, can we expect to turn this crisis around? Regrettably, I'm skeptical of the State Department's performance. Witness that latest mess that Congressman uh, Dan Burton just mentioned, the delivery of armor flooring, which did not fit the Blackhawks, which we had earlier provided to the anti-drug police, causing them to sit on the tarmac for months without the ability to participate in Colombia's drug war. These endless series of failures don't give us much comfort. It's essential that we face the reality that there is a narco-based war raging in Colombia. And the good guys, our friends and neighbors in Colombia, are losing. Our national security is at stake and so is the future of Colombia, and so is the future of many other nations. It's encouraging that yesterday, a high-level U.S. delegation went to Colombia to meet with their leaders to discuss Speaker Hastert's $1.6 billion aid package to Colombia that will escalate Colombia's war on drugs. We'll be taking up that Plan Colombia aid package in early March. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today, Mr. Chairman, and particularly I'm anxious to hear how the administration reached its decision to heavily tilt this counter-narcotics aid package toward the military over the police. As we all know, the elite anti-drug police in Colombia have a proven track record fighting drugs consistent with a fundamental respect for human rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to recognize now uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. You're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to compliment you on 
uh, your sensitivity to these issues. Uh, I think your leadership in the Congress in this area has been important. I, I want to say from the outset that uh, the administration has worked cooperatively, as I understand, with uh, President Pastrana in trying to create uh, an environment which would be conducive to the uh, maintenance of that democracy. And I think that as we review the testimony today, we're going to see that the uh, quality of the democracy is in danger because of uh, this narco-terrorism. I think that General McCafferty has certainly uh, given us solid leadership in trying to see the United States' interests are protected. But I think, that, I hope that in the uh, hearing today, we'll be able to determine uh, the extent to which uh, President Pastrana's efforts towards trying to achieve a peaceful negotiation uh, uh, to, uh, with FARC has uh, been undermined by the uh, rising narcotics trade in Colombia. And that if we can see what the links <coughs> are uh, with uh, not only FARC, but any of the other elements that are involved in uh, narco traffic, uh, we can uh, perhaps learn a little bit better why efforts towards peaceful resolution have been frustrated. I want to, uh, again, thank the chair for his leadership. And um, I, I look forward to reviewing this testimony. I have, uh, as uh, I'm sure some members do, uh, competing claims on my time right now. But I do want to thank you for uh, pursuing on this very important subject. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays. Thank you. I deeply regret that President Clinton, when he took office in 1993, de-emphasized the war on drugs and cut the drug czar's budget by nearly half in the first two years. Colombia, Colombians have been fighting the drug war for years with their lives. Over 10 years ago, I went to Bogota with a delegation of members of Congress to visit with government officials and the victims of the bombing of their DAS building which is their FBI building. 700 people were injured, over 70 were killed. It is true Colombians export the bulk of drugs to the United States. But it is equally true we, the United States, still export the chemicals to make the drugs. We, the United States, still export the weapons to protect the terrorists and drug lords. And we, the United States, still, not the government, have allowed still the export of the dollars to pay for the drugs. We clearly have a practical and deep moral obligation to help our brothers and sisters in the South fight this drug war. Thank the uh, gentleman. Uh, the gentlelady from Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to raise some serious questions that I raised last August when we had a, a similar hearing and that I feel still have not been answered and are now being also raised by other credible voices including the New York Times and Chicago Tribune editorial boards and um, amba former ambassador to El Salvador and, and uh, Paraguay Robert White. The, uh, Administration's $1.3 billion aid package to Colombia, $955 million in security assistance, puts the United States at a crossroads. Do we invest in a militaristic drug war that escalates the regional conflict in the name of fighting drugs, or do we attack the drug market by investing in prevention and treatment at home and seek to assist in stabilizing Colombia? According to the General Accounting Office, despite years of extensive herbicide spraying, United States estimates show there has not been any net reduction in coca cultivation. Net coca cultivation actually increased 50 percent, unquote. And this 50 percent increase in coca cultivation comes after $625 million in counter narcotics operations in Colombia between 1990 and 1998. So considering the demonstrated failure of militarized eradication efforts to date, why should we believe that investing even more money in this plan will achieve a different result? And what will it take to achieve total victory in Colombia? Are we prepared to make that type of investment in dollars and in lives? How many lives? And if not, what is the purpose of this aid? Considering the fact that more than 100,000 civilians have died in Colombia's civil war and five servicemen 
uh, perish on a reconnaissance flight last year? Is it ethical to escalate the war in Colombia in order to prevent Americans from purchasing cocaine? Will the aid achieve a 10 percent reduction or a 20 percent reduction or a 50 percent reduction in drugs? What is the target amount or is the purpose to degrade the military uh, capability of the FARC or bomb them to the negotiating table? I am mystified that there's nothing in this package um, aimed at paramilitary groups despite the known involvement, uh, their known involvement in the, in the drug trade. And why are we investing so heavily with so few accountability measures in the Colombian Armed Forces, which has long had a history of human rights violations, including support for military groups? The New York Times on Sunday warned, quote, Washington should have learned long ago that partnership with an abusive and ineffective Latin American military rarely produces positive results and often undermines democracy in the region, unquote. Exactly what is it that we believe this aid will accomplish? Is it the first in a series of blank checks for a war with no foreseeable end game? What is the exit strategy? With the continued failure of a military solution to drug production in Con Colombia, why shouldn't an innovative alternative development approach be used instead? Why not spend half or all the money on crop substitution or development? A landmark study of cocaine markets by the Rand Corporation found that providing treatment to cocaine users, treatment to cocaine users, is 10 times more effective than drug interdiction schemes and 23 times more cost effective than eradicating coca at its source. If decreasing drug use in America is the ultimate goal, why aren't we putting equal resources into domestic demand reduction where each dollar spent is 23 times more effective than eradication? Today we're discussing a billion plus dollars for Colombia um, and, and yet we aren't doing enough for treatment here at home. A recent study by researchers at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, has indicated that 48 percent of the need for drug treatment, not including alcohol abuse, is unmet in the United States. Why is it that we can find funds for overseas military operations while continuing to ignore the enormous lack of drug treatment here at home? Mr. Chairman, before becoming entangled in a foreign war, it seems to me that the Congress should use its oversight authority to require the administration to explain how this escalation will reduce illicit drug use at home better than investment in prevention and treatment in the United States. The administration should also explain how increasing funds for a policy will change the result when past increases in support have not changed the outcome. These troubling strategic issues need to be resolved in a satisfactory manner before we increase our involvement in Colombia. I appreciate your indulgence on the time, and I thank you very much. Thank you, gentlelady. I look forward to General McCaffrey's response to some of the points she's raised. It must be fun, uh, General, to get it from uh, both sides here. Uh, let me recognize, <laughs> if I may, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Uh, Ross Thank Layton. you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. And as you pointed out in your opening statement, uh, Colombia is one of our uh, oldest democracies, and it is uh, a shame to see this uh, beautiful country mired in, in crisis after crisis with the uh, increasing control of the narco guerrillas in Colombia and in surrounding areas with the increase in uh, cocoa production. And when the U.S. Congress does uh, step in and try to help the Colombian people who have sacrificed uh, so much, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Shays has pointed out, with their own blood in this uh, ongoing uh, drug war, uh, the administration looks like the uh, Keystone Cops uh, sending in uh, the wrong armor kit to uh, fund the Black Hawk helicopters that especially Mr. Burton, Mr. Gilman uh, have fought uh, so long to uh, give to the uh, Colombians to, to fight the narco guerrillas. We sent them the wrong armor kit to outfit these uh, Black Hawks. We sent them outdated and, and useless ammunition and send it also to the wrong place. And uh, while all of this uh, crisis looms over Colombia and law-abiding Colombians uh, pay the price, uh, the, the continuing threat of the, the tentacles of, of FARC uh, looms over all the neighboring countries because hemispheric stability is very important to the U.S. interests. What happens in Colombia can have a, a devastating effect on the very fragile democracies of uh, Venezuela, of Ecuador, and, and Peru. And to say nothing, as uh, the gentlewoman from Illinois pointed out, of our ongoing crisis here in the United States, our, our alarming uh, drug statistics, 
uh, the uh, increasing number of young people who are dying from uh, drug abuse. So I agree with, uh, with what, the, uh, what Chairman uh, Burton had said, that this is not a, uh, a, a war on drugs just for Colombia, that this is a war that's got to engage all of us. It is an international war on drugs. It is not uh, just a domestic war. And uh, we need to ask uh, some real questions in the coming months as the debate heats up on this aid package. Will this aid package work? Is it uh, going to do what we hope that it will do? Are the funds going to the right organizations? Is it correct to continue to fund the Colombian military? And should we be increasing the role of organizations such as the CNP? So we, we look forward to uh, engaging the administration at long last uh, on this uh, very important topic. And we hope uh, for the sake of our young people and for the sake of stability in our southern neighbors that we will have uh, an end soon to this uh, narco uh, drug war. And, and we think that it will be once we get engaged and once we give the proper folks the tools they need uh, to get rid of this uh, venom that is uh, increasing in its uh, deadly toll on our young people. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. the gentlelady. Now recognize the vice uh, chairman of our panel, a gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you indicated that uh, you look forward to the general, uh, perhaps enlightening the gentlelady from Illinois, uh, whose hostility to helping Columbia uh, has blinded her to the facts. Uh, one doesn't even have to wait uh, in order to hear from General McCaffrey. One simply has to look at the facts and look at uh, what the general placed in his uh, written testimony. Uh, demand reduction activities account for 32.3 percent of the national drug control budget. Uh, that is one-third. International efforts are only 8.4 percent of the budget, and interdiction activities are only 10.4. Uh, so by any measure, uh, the amount of money that we are expending for interdiction uh, and international efforts is, in fact, currently far less than that devoted to demand reduction. Perhaps the gentlelady's hostility to uh, interdiction and international efforts uh, might be directed to asking some very tough questions of the administration as to what is happening to all of that demand reduction money that is already being placed into treatment, prevention, and research. That might be a little bit more productive. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Indiana, the chairman of the committee, uh, was very kind, as he usually is, and very soft in his uh, statements. Uh, he uh, used the word, the term screw-up, uh, several times. Uh, I think the better word is sabotage. Very few things happen at the Department of State or in any agencies of our U.S. government simply by incompetence uh, or mistakes. Uh, in my experience, Mr. Chairman, uh, things happen because they are planned to happen that way. Steps are taken or not taken because an intended result is sought to be accomplished. Sometimes that intended result can be accomplished by taking positive action. Sometimes, as in the case of this administration and this Department of State, it frequently uh, is, uh, is accomplished by not doing certain things. Uh, and in fact, uh, I believe that the lack of uh, equipment going to uh, the, uh, the uh, heroic efforts of General Serrano and the Colombian government uh, in fact, uh, is a calculated effort by the State Department to sabotage our efforts to get the material, to get the resources to the uh, forces in Colombia that are fighting the narco-terrorists and is not the result of simple incompetence. And I hope that this hearing today and other hearings we will have in the future will highlight that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, ask at this point uh, unanimous consent to have inserted in the record uh, an article that you authored which appeared today in the Washington Times entitled was War on Drug Sabotaged, uh, which uh, as, uh, as is uh, par for uh, your writings and your comments was uh, direct to the point, substantiated by uh, substantial uh, references to the record and uh, facts. And I ask unanimous consent to have that inserted. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, during the course of, uh, of these uh, hearings and future hearings, uh, and I know, Mr. Chairman, both you and the two other chairmen uh, that are with us today, Mr. Gilman and Mr. Burton, uh, intend to have uh, further hearings as well. I do hope that one of the things we focus on uh, is that uh, we and our partners in Colombia learn from success. Uh, frequently, uh, people don't learn from their mistakes. We are refusing to learn from our successes. When we had a balanced, comprehensive, tough policy against drugs uh, in the Reagan and Bush years, the success was palpable. Uh, we saw demand uh, reduced. We saw the uh, use of drugs, particularly by teenagers, drop dramatically. 
uh, when, uh, when our colleague, uh, President Fujimori uh, in Peru, uh, took tough, consistent steps. Uh, uh, one of his policies was, you fly, you die, uh, his shoot-down policy, amassing troops in those areas, such as the northern border of uh, Peru, uh, which uh, borders the southern region of Colombia, uh, amassing troops up there, taking concrete steps uh, in Iquitos and the river area up there, uh, the riverine uh, 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 traffic areas, has paid tremendous dividends. And that is why, uh, as General McCaffrey has stated in his uh, written testimony, uh, the production of uh, raw coca and the production of cocaine uh, in those two Andean countries to the south of Colombia, and that is Peru and Bolivia, have dropped dramatically. That doesn't happen by chance. It doesn't happen by screw-up. It happens because those countries are taking a tough, consistent, aggressive stand against these people. They don't negotiate with them, they fight them. And the sooner the Colombian government realizes that, the sooner we get people in an administration that realize that, then we will continue to see the successes that we saw earlier in the 1990s, and yet we are not seeing today. While I certainly agree with uh, Chairman Burton in saying that to the administration, you know, we'd rather have you here later than not at all, uh, that is not the end of the game. We have to monitor this, uh, this assistance if we, in, in fact, can get it through the Congress and the President signs it, because this administration has a sorry record of not doing what the law provides. We even had a U.S. ambassador to Colombia appear before uh, one of our committees a couple of years ago and basically said under oath in response to questions as to why the law was not being carried out uh, in Colombia uh, by him, uh, he said, well, I work for the president, and if I'm directed not to do something, then I don't do it. That is the sort of problem that we have here, Mr. Chairman, and I commend you for holding these hearings and future hearings and the other chairmen that are here today to not only get to the bottom of this, but to, but to constantly draw attention to what is happening with this administration and why we are losing the interdiction effort uh, when the success uh, stories are out there, what works, we know works, it has worked in the past, and let's use it now. Thank the gentleman. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. I think it's sad that we're to this point when we could see many years ago that we were going to get to this point. Um, and I do believe that we were slow in getting there. But I also want to thank not only General Serrano and the people in Colombia who have been dying and fighting because of the uh, drug abuse in this country, but to thank General McCaffrey. Uh, because I think since he has come in, he has aggressively fought inside an administration that had uh, seriously neglected this problem and has been an advocate internally. I want to thank General Wilhelm and Randy Beers, who have been through many uh, 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 battles as we've tried to get additional narcotics funding in. Uh, we saw, I've been down there now five straight years in a row, have I've worked to get the Black Hawk helicopters to the National Police. We've battled over every dollar. We've argued about the diversions to the Balkans when I believe the compelling national interest was in the Southern Hemisphere. Clearly, our number one oil supplier is Venezuela. Uh, Colombia is our, our second biggest supplier of oil byproducts. We have the Panama Canal, now uh, questionable whether it can be defended where the, the uh, narco terrorists continuing to move up from the Darien Peninsula, in addition to the kids dying in Fort Wayne and all over this country because of the drug problem. Clearly, this is a compelling national interest, and we need at this point to figure out how best to accomplish the goals as fast as possible. As someone who's been aggressively an advocate of the best equipment possible in the Blackhawks, I think we need to look at our mix in this package to see how much we can get delivered, how fast, what can be the most effective mix. I think we need to look at this question of, I understand the argument of that the National Police may not be able to carry out all this battle without the defense and the military, and I agree with that basic premise. But we need to make sure that when we're transferring the funds to the military, that in fact, that they change, which they are committed to trying to change, but I don't want to hear about the, them only having non-high school graduates, draftees, as opposed to volunteer people at adequate numbers who have been trained to have a long-term commitment to this group like they do to the National Police and that this is an elite unit. Because if we pour these dollars into a defense department that in fact hasn't developed an elite unit, they will be wasted dollars and then the charges will become true in and of themselves. That suggests that in the phase-in process, we may want to have a little bit different mix as the Defense Department and their military gets up to speed. We know the human rights record of the National Police. I believe that this administration under President Pastrana and the new Defense Minister and others are committed to cleaning up the past problems in human rights, whether it be with the right-wing terrorist groups or with the 
uh, in the paramilitary or with the FARC or the ELN, but in fact we need to make sure of that before we put all of our eggs and or the bulk of our eggs in this new dollars in one area. So I hope that we'll have a fair debate as we work through the specifics of the package. Uh, I believe that there are people in this administration who have been battling, and it's good to see that the president's now on board too. We need to figure out how to reduce this incredible increasing supply coming into our country and work together to get it done. I yield back. Thank you, and uh, recognize now the gentleman from California, Mr. Osi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to be here. I came this morning primarily because every time I have the opportunity to visit with General McCaffrey, I learn something new, and I'm grateful for his appearance today. Of specific interest to me today, and I regret he's not on the witness list, as I was hopeful of visiting with Mr. Beers about what intestinal fortitude it took to actually come forward with the news that we had been so brilliant as to deliver 50-year-old ammunition to the uh, Colombian National Police and then to turn around and replace that by shipping 50,000 more rounds to the State Department. I understand Foggy Bottom is very dangerous this time of year, uh, but I was hopeful that we'd have an adequate explanation from that. General McCaffrey, I have the utmost respect for you. Uh, you have the most difficult job possibly in this entire administration, and I am looking forward to your testimony today. Back. Thank you. I think that concludes our opening statements, and uh, I want to take just a moment to thank the members of our subcommittee and uh, also uh, Mr. Uh, Gilman, who chairs the International Relations Committee, the Speaker of the House, uh, Mr. Hastert, uh, for their uh, co-hosting the recent International Drug Summit that our subcommittee and committee uh, participated, and uh, the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Burton, uh, for also helping to sponsor that, and everyone who participated. We brought together uh, nearly 50 parliamentarians from around the world, representatives of other Congresses, uh, leaders uh, in the international anti-narcotics uh, effort, uh, heads of Europol, Interpol, uh, and uh, also uh, demand uh, uh, and uh, treatment uh, programs from throughout the world, because we know we can't win uh, this war on drugs uh, fighting it alone. also want to pay particular uh, tribute and thanks to uh, General McCaffrey, who was a full participant uh, in those proceedings, and hopefully they will uh, uh, be product productive and uh, fruitful. Uh, with that, I'd like to now recognize our first uh, panel, and, and that consists of uh, uh, one individual who, who's well known to all of us, uh, General Barry McCaffrey, who's director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Welcome back. I think you saw that we have uh, some diversity of opinion, uh, certainly no loss for words. Uh, and I would like to, uh, again, advise you this is an Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee of Congress. If you'd stand, please, sir, and be sworn. <clears throat> Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this Subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, welcome back. And uh, this is a very serious topic. Uh, to update members of the panel, uh, the latest statistics we have received is in 1997, 15,973 Americans lost their lives to drug-related uh, uh, causes, and over 100,000 probably since 1992. So this has an incredible impact on our society. With those opening comments, uh, General, you, uh, we will not run any clock on you. Uh, we appreciate your patience in hearing the diversity of opinion from our panel and uh, welcome your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, to you and, and Congresswoman Mink, uh, for the opportunity to meet uh, with you to respond to your own interest and to try and put some context in what has been an enormously complex and challenging problem that we've faced over the last several years. Uh, one which I might add that I bring a sort of an unusual historical perspective to uh, having worked at not only for four years in the current position as a drug policy director, but also two years prior to that, happier times, I can assure you, as Commander-in-Chief of Southern Command, uh, preceded by um, uh, several years of service on the Joint Staff uh, working for General Powell. 
and I'd be glad to try and uh, put into uh, perspective what it is we're trying to achieve and how we're going about it. Uh, let me also, if I may, thank you for including the right people in this hearing. Ambassador Pete Romero, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense Anna Maria Salazar, uh, DEA Ops Officer William uh, Ledwith, and most particularly, uh, SYNC U.S. Southern Command General Charles Willem, uh, all have been uh, enormously effective partners in this effort. Uh, someone who isn't here today and has actually been the quarterback of this effort uh, is Tom Pickering, who with a interagency team, Randy Beers and others, is now in Colombia uh, dealing with just this issue. <clears throat> so I think your timing on the hearing is, uh, is appropriate, and I welcome the diversity of viewpoint that was rep represented in your opening statements. Uh, let me also take note that you've called upon uh, former Ambassador to Columbia, Morris Busby, a uh, figure of enormous courage and, and uh, dedication to this issue, and counsel, currently Council of the Americas uh, President, uh, former Ambassador Ted McNamara, another extremely knowledgeable, thoughtful person uh, on the issues we face. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you uh, five brief sets of comments uh, to show you where we are, and then I'll uh, be glad to respond to your own interests. Let me, if I may, though, begin by uh, asking your permission to put into the record uh, both written comments and copies of the charts I'll show you. We've done a tremendous amount of work to capture the numbers that will allow us to have an adequate policy debate on this issue in Without the coming weeks. Without that uh, material would be made part of the record. Um, Chris, if you would, uh, go ahead and take down that uh, first chart. Let me, if I may, talk generally to this issue. First of all, to say that uh, we do have an overall strategy, U.S. national drug strategy. What we're talking about is goal number five. How do we reduce the supply of drugs, both foreign and domestic? And this national strategy has a classified secret annex uh, in which we lay out the supporting uh, symmetrical guidance to overseas intelligence, law enforcement, the armed forces, etc. Um, it's working pretty well. The central element of the national drug strategy on the north-south axis was to build multinational cooperation. And so we are trying to move from what I would characterize as a series of bilateral confrontations to one of multinational cooperation. On 4 October in Montevideo, Uruguay, we signed an enormously important document. It came from the Santiago Summit of the Americas. It basically committed all of us in the hemisphere to building practical ways of cooperation, not only in the obvious ways, intelligence sharing, interdiction, extradition, evidence sharing, precursor chemicals, uh, but also indeed to broaden this discussion to include uh, demand reduction topics, science, uh, and uh, media campaigns targeted reducing consumption among adolescents. We think we're moving that general, larger concept in the right direction. The second thing we did was we went to the Andean Ridge. Uh, it's important for us to understand sort of the overview facts. The supply of drugs in the world grossly exceeds United States demand. We do not consume most of the drugs in the world. Probably we consume, as an example, around 3% of the world's heroin. Probably we consume a quarter of the world's cocaine. Our problem is we have too much money, and so our money fuels international crime, and indeed one could argue uh, has a corrosive impact uh, on democratic institutions through violence and corruption. Having said that, the cocaine in the world comes out of three nations, essentially, Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia. And in sum, uh, these numbers I, I placed into the record now to give you the uh, CNC's overview of where we are, we have achieved dramatic successes in two of those countries. Peru, the dominant cocaine-producing nation on the face of the earth, uh, under President Fujimori's leadership, has reduced production by more than 55 percent, 95. Per, um, excuse me, 66 percent. Bolivia, under the Bonzer uh, Caroga uh, team, has cut down in a very short period of time, essentially two and a half years, 
uh, production by more than 55 percent. I have personally seen this. This comes out of our CIA crop analysis studies. I have flown over the Shapare Wayaga. The coca is disappearing from the valley floors. They're on the right track. And I, we ought to be a little modest about claiming undue credit on this, uh, because I would argue it was a political will of the Peruvians and the Bolivians and their uh, police forces and democratic institutions that achieved most of it. But we're moving in the right direction. The problem is Colombia. We've just uh, published in the last uh, three weeks revised past crop estimates on cocaine production. We went back and revised our, uh, our algorithm on alkaloid content in the plants. Uh, they've got a new species they're using. We went back and looked at laboratory effectiveness. They're using new, better industrial techniques. And we looked at, uh, of course, our uh, very solid data of overhead satellite photography. And we came up with uh, an analysis that suggests cocaine production in, Colum in Colombia has gone up 140 percent in a little uh, less than four years. Today, yesterday, we released the crop estimates for this year. Colombia produced, in our view, 520 metric tons of cocaine. It is astonishing. We're talking 70 percent or more of the world total, uh, and that cocaine, we would argue, is the heart and soul uh, of the, the incredible impact that 26,000 armed people are having on Colombian democratic institutions. The FARC, the ELN, the AUC, so-called paramilitary terrorist groups, if they were just using bank robberies, kidnappings, extortion, blowing up the oil pipelines, Colombia would be in mayhem. But when you add to that total, in President Pastrana's terms, a million or two a day, we're talking money of 300 million to a billion a year. So when you see the video outtakes of the FARC units in the field, they're wearing shiny new uniforms. They have more machine guns than the Colombian infantry battalions have. They have planes and helicopters and wiretap equipment and they are assassinating mayors and intimidating journalists and corrupting public officials. And oh, by the way, it's not just in Colombia. It's spilled over in a significant way into the neighboring regional partners of Venezuela and Ecuador and Panama in particular, and it has an enormous impact on the United States. And I, if you would allow me to correct a number I'm trying to drive into our public debate, it isn't 14,000 dead a year. It's 52,000 dead a year. Your congressional funds went to do a decent study that went through the autopsy reports across the nation, and that's our view of the unmistakable impact of drug abuse by 6% of our population on the death rates, along with the $110 billion in damages, along with the fact that it drives our criminal justice system, our health care system, and our welfare system. And as you look at the Andean Ridge, Colombia is now the nexus, the center of mass of 80 percent of the illegal drugs coming into America in terms of heroin and cocaine. And we think we need to stand with uh, Democratic uh, partners in the region. Uh, let me, if I may, uh, go ahead and uh, put, put up the next chart. Uh, again, show you the numbers and to show you that the drug problem, which is my legal responsibility, my portfolio, is related unmistakably to two other problems. One of them is the peace process. And I think there, there's no question the misery of the Colombian people, which has been uh, caused by decades of endemic violence, almost unimaginable violence, with no apparent outcome, is, is the top national priority, not only for the president, but for the people, the 36 million people that live in this country. And yet, when you look at it, as long as the FARC, the ELN, the paramilitaries have this tremendous wealth, if there's no quid pro quo, if there's no reward and punishment, why would they talk instead of fight? Now, the third issue that President Pastrana has to face up to is the economy. Colombia is a huge country. And I've been trying to correct tiny Colombia to remind us it's probably a third to half the size of Western Europe. It's got a lot of people 
they, they are wealthy in terms of natural resources, oil, gas, flowers, coffee beans, etc. They have tremendous economic potential, and they've had smart economic leadership. But they're in an economic crisis, 20 percent unemployment, enormous impact on the inflation rate. Why would anyone invest in Colombia with 26,000 people in the field who will abduct you and torture you until you pay money to get free? And so Colombia has become a net importer of food. And there's a strong argument out of our own intelligence system that within the coming five years or so, they may actually turn into a net importer of energy. It is an outrage. And again, it comes from the drug issue. Next uh, chart. We can't just deal with Colombia. Several of you, of you made that point. I think you're quite correct. Uh, we've done an enormously good job in supporting Peruvian and Bolivian authorities and Thai authorities. And as you look around the world, particularly the DEA with their worldwide mission, has been quite skillful in uh, creating new realities. But in this region, we have to take into account with the package, the $1.6 billion we forwarded to Congress, that this is not a Colombian problem, it's regional. So you'll see in there significant assets, first for uh, Peru and Bolivia, and both the Vice President of, of Bolivia and the Prime Minister of Peru have been up to see me to express their view that there should be more. Um, I think the logic is, is tenuous, but I'm not prepared to argue publicly against it. Uh, there is money in here, potentially. We have made the final calls on Brazil, Venezuela. We have a problem with overflight. Uh, as well as Panama and other nations. We clearly see Ecuador as involved in the drug issue. We got to approach this as a regional problem. And then finally, we can't do this if we don't provide Sink U.S. Southern Command with the assets he requires to support the effort with adequate air interdiction assets. And secondly, if we don't give him the intelligence collection tools and training tools he needs to do his job. And with the enormous drawdown in the Department of Defense and with the kind of assets that are being retired out of the force, we are inadequately supporting our sink in the U.S. Southern Command. We're going to have to think through this and sort out how do we go about it. Fortunately, we've had U.S. Customs Service step in and provide a tremendous uh, air uh, interdiction surveillance uh, capability as well as other government agencies. U.S. Coast Guard's done a superb job. Uh, also with FLIR air aircraft and, and direct uh, intelligence collection. A regional problem. Thank you. Chris, next. Right. Um, we sent over a plan, $1.6 billion. We look forward to hearing your own viewpoints on, uh, on this plan. Uh, it's not written in concrete. There's something important, though, to understand about the $1.6 billion. We can't talk about it unless it's in the context of the Colombian devised strategy, Plan Colombia. We cannot substitute U.S. thinking, certainly neither among congressional staffs nor in the administration, for having the President of Colombia, his Minister of Defense, Foreign Minister, Interior, Plante, and others devise their own approach to this, and that's what we did. They've come up with a document, it's conceptual and outline, it needs meat on it, it's not yet a planning document. But it called for $7.5 billion. That was $4 billion out of the Colombian budget. That's where the CNP is getting resourced. It called for $3.5 billion out of the European Union, international banks, etc. And that's where an enormous amount of what I think is a very coherent, integrated alternative economic development, building judicial systems, etc. That's where the preponderance of that money will come from, the, uh, from their international uh, loans as well as support from the European Union, a process in which the administration has actively supported uh, their attempts to gain international support. Uh, and I tell you that because otherwise it looks like you, one can make an argument that I think is incorrect, that it doesn't take into account the broader requirements in Colombia. Now, if you look at the $1.6 billion itself, to simplify it, it's a $950 million supplemental, and it's a $350 million add-on in the FY2001 budget to the $300 million we already had in there for the Andean Ridge. If you look at the total package, essentially 85% of it goes to Colombia. 
the rest goes to Peru and Bolivia. They're, they're just about flatlined. I would argue at fairly high levels of resources, we have not decremented them as coca production has plunged. Then of the remainder of the, the program, if you look at it, half of it is a mobility package. That's what that is. It's 63 helicopters, 30 Blackhawks, 33 UN, uh, UH-1Ns rebuilt with the operational requirements, the spare parts, the training package to get the crews. That's what it is. And that mobility package, in our view, in the Colombian plan, uh, plan allows Colombian democratic institutions to regain sovereignty over their own terrain, particularly in the south. And I'll, I'll be in uh, Colombia next Tuesday through Thursday. We'll go into Trace Esquinas. As you land in Putumayo, or anywhere down in that southern zone, essentially a third of the land area is under coca cultivation. It is unbelievable. And there's five FARC fronts down there, thousands of them armed to the teeth. And they're targeting our aircraft going in and out of those, those fields right now. This is, in that part of Colombia, an out-and-out -out war over drugs. And I would add to that, if you would allow me, some notion of uh, are we support, what's the, uh, the debate between supporting the police and the armed for forces? In our view, this should be Colombian strategic thinking, not U.S. But I would tell you straight up, the Colombian police, who are enormously uh, courageous, this General Serrano has cleansed their ranks. He fired 3,000 cops when he took over. By and large, they're doing pretty well as a high-integrity, high-courage force. There's 2,500 of these cops that are essentially assault units. We do not want to militarize the Colombian police and make anemic the Colombian armed forces. Those 2,500 Dante cops are not going down south <coughs> and kicking buns on five FARC fronts and cutting down the coca. We have to allow the Colombians to reassert control, and that means that their Navy Marine Corps has a first-rate conceptual plan to go get control of the riverine system. Those are the roads down there. They've got to go down there and do that. The Colombian Army has got to get back into these places on the frontier, La Rondia, Tres Esquinas in particular, and regain control so that the police can enter in a law enforcement way, provide alternative economic development as well as crop eradication. That's what the Colombians are going to try and achieve. It looks sensible, I think it's well thought out, and I do believe it's achievable. Um, thanks. Um, finally, just uh, if I may, in a sort of a conceptual outline of what are we trying to do down here, what's the deal? Um, I don't think it's useful to any of us to waste too much time on the history of it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> without question, your leadership and others has been instrumental in achieving adequate levels of support for this counter-drug strategy, and I am publicly appreciative of what you've done, along with many of your colleagues. Um, I think the history of it's not terribly important to me, but I'm worried that we not get involved in anemic political theater over who lost Colombia. Nobody lost Colombia, and we're not going to save it. 36 million Colombians are. Now, having said that, we all learned in college, in freshman logic classes, you shouldn't argue about facts. I don't think we're going to argue about facts. I think the facts are this is what has happened since 1995 on support to Colombia. These are the facts. We went up 3,500 percent in the support we provided Colombian authorities, 95 to 2001. Congress had a great deal to do with that. But it started at 29.8, went to 62.8, 117.5, 166, 367, and we just sent down over a billion dollars. That's the facts. Now, another set of facts, I don't want us to get too far down in the details of one helicopter, two, or three. I've got the details. I know what they are, and I'd be glad to share them with you. But I would like you to understand, if you start in 94, 
and go to 2,000 on helicopters to Colombia, uh, you find that we've put 28 Blackhawks in there, 10 Huey 2s, 24 Bell 212s, 22 UH 1N. What about the CNP, the police? We got 47 aircraft on the ground, of which 42 were provided by the United States. Is this adequate? No. Are there three more to go? Yes. Of the six we authorized, three are there, minus armor packages. But you've got to understand this, the Black Hawk, the best helicopter on the face of the Earth. The next time you see me, I'll probably be peddling them, I hope. It's an incredible piece of machinery, but it takes 10 months to build one. The first three went down there in eight months. So, of course, he's done a tremendous job supporting us. And there's three more to go. And they're customized for CNP. That's why armor kits don't automatically fit. And by the way, there's 30 more in this plan. And beyond that, the Colombians are going to buy 17 more. So it's clear to me, with your support, we can finally get an adequate level of mobility. We're still hung up, Mr. Burton, on the six of them and did I flip-flop. And let me just tell you again, quite clearly, when the six helicopter question came up, I am unabashedly in favor of it, but not at the cost of jerking out of Bolivian and Peruvian INL funding at the last minute. 50% of the dollars for a nation that finally started eradicating cocaine. That was the deal. When Congress wisely, Congressional Initiative, provided funds for six with their spare parts, etc., I was glad to support it. And I'm certainly glad to support the robust package we're, we've now placed in front of you. Final note, even on the notion of a robust package, um, I would argue that the reason to support uh, this package, taking into full account the, the legitimate concerns on human rights and the peace process, which need to be answered to your satisfaction, uh, I think the, uh, when, we, when we do this, we need to understand this is a huge national security and health and educational threat to us. That's why we're doing it. And oh, by the way, Columbia and the Andean Ridge are important international uh, partners. But the number of aircraft we're talking about is half the number of aircraft that I had in my division as one of nine U.S. military divisions in the Gulf War uh, attack. So this is a reasonably sized package to let General Willem and others, a U.S. ambassador, support Colombian uh, planning. Uh, I think uh, we sent you something that merits your full consideration. Uh, I thank you for the chance to lay out this thinking, and I look forward, sir, to responding to your own questions. Thank you for your uh, comments and your testimony. Um, one of the concerns that, that uh, I've had is um, I think that uh, it's common knowledge and the press has reported that Colombia is now the third largest uh, recipient of U.S. Uh, uh, assistance. I guess after Israel and Egypt. <clears throat> and uh, most of that took place, uh, I believe, uh, funded uh, a year ago, uh, this previous to this past October, uh, appropriated by the, the Congress. Uh, I tried to give a full year of time uh, for those funds to be appropriated in their fiscal year up to uh, October 1st then became concerned that uh, less than half of the money was actually uh, in uh, Colombia and uh, held several closed-door meetings, uh, not to embarrass the administration, but to see if we could work together to get those resources online. Uh, it still appears that we have uh, uh, problems in getting that equipment to Colombia, General. Uh, and now we have a, a, a billion dollar plus package here. Uh, what, uh, what would you say that you'll be able to do to make certain that things that have been promised, uh, the president has made several pronouncements of uh, surplus material back to 97 that uh, haven't been delivered. Uh, uh, how, how are we going to ensure that 
uh, this uh, equipment and these resources get there? Well, I, I think you put your uh, finger on an on a enormously legitimate concern. Um, you know, you look at the, the management tools we have in place, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Colombia, the interagency process here in Washington, uh, it's inadequate to handle this workload. Uh, we'll screw this up seriously if we don't put together a mechanism that's adequate for the challenge, assuming Congress <laughs> passes a program uh, adequate to the task. So uh, I think the, f the fellow who most clearly understands that, besides Mr. Berger, is uh, Madeleine Albright's asked Undersecretary Pickering to be our quarterback. So we're going to, uh, we're not ready to reveal the, how exactly how we're going to do this. We're pulling together a team, a high level team, to be a permanent secretariat for the interagency process. Uh, we've got to give our sink the right guidance. He's got 800 people in a headquarters in Miami, perfectly prepared to manage heavy lifting. And then we're going to have to look at the U.S. Embassy and make sure we've got the, the right kinds of people. Well, one of the um, things that I did uh, just on sh a short term was call every agency in. We did this behind closed doors, and I did it fairly regularly up to just recently. Uh, I, I really would like your assurance that you're doing the same thing because somebody has to be constantly on top of this, uh, General. The other concern I'd have, and let me say uh, we have General Wilhelm will be here. I must say that the military has been able to get the, some of the resources in place uh, rather efficiently, and uh, I think they've got one battalion trained. Uh, they had one incursion, I think, that was successful as opposed to the Colombians getting their pants beat off. But this report that I ordered from uh, GA, uh, GAO uh, it came out in December. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with it, and maybe we could put that one chart up there. It doesn't match exactly to this one, but it, this says DOD's intelligence, surveillance, uh, reconnaissance, counter-drug aircraft support in Central and South America, and it has what's requested by uh, the Southern Command and then provided by DOD, and it, it shows actually a, a declining from 98 to uh, 99. I mean, only a fraction of what was provided. And um, there's two ways to, to go after this stuff. Uh, one is stopping it at its source through eradication, alternative uh, development, et cetera. And then the other is getting it as it's coming out. Uh, but that requires intelligence and information. Now, we provided in 98 an unprecedented amount of uh, funds from the Congress uh, for all aspects of this effort. However, in 99 and DOD, which I think has been doing a good job with what, they're been, what they've been given, got very little of what was requested. Uh, what's happening here? Well, we've got some uh, force structure problems. Uh, the military now, uh, U.S. Armed Forces is the smallest since 1939, the year my dad was sworn in as an infantry officer. Uh, we're moving. Uh, some of the uh, more suitable platforms out of the active inventory and into retirement. Uh, we have other worldwide assets. I won't pretend to, uh, to speak to those responsibilities. Uh, that's sort of an overview of the challenge that uh, we face on, you know, some very serious uh, efforts. Now, having said that, um, I think one of the biggest sim single problems we had with withdrawal from Panama, when we lost Airfield Howard, uh, we lost a superb 2,000 airmen, seven day a week, 24 hour a day operation, provided two to 3,000 flights a year. Uh, that was one of the biggest problems. We've now reset the, uh, our assets. We're operating in many locations. We're trying, Congress has given us the funds to begin three FOLs, Aruba, Curacao, Monta, Ecuador. Uh, we're operating out of Roosevelt Roads. Uh, I believe uh, the Customs Service has stepped up in a major way to support us as has the Coast Guard, uh, but, but we have a, a tremendous decrement uh, based on the loss of uh, Panama, forward basing in Panama. Well, General, finally, uh, probably one of the most difficult part of my, <coughs> parts of my job has been one to deal with uh, the parents of uh, children who uh, who've died, uh, the 50,000 and 15,900 direct deaths uh, in my district. Even more so, I had to write uh, the parents of uh, one of the individuals who was killed uh, over Columbia, who was uh, from Central Florida, uh, and uh, tell them that they're 
young person uh, died in a, an, an a effort so that thousands of others wouldn't die and with drug overdoses and uh, the ravages of drugs on our street. I think one of the concerns we've heard expressed here is how many U.S. troops will be dedicated to this effort. Uh, and maybe you could tell us what you think this will take in Colombia. And I know there will be none fighting, but uh, uh, in training and other missions and how many uh, individuals will have at risk. Because that, again, is a, the toughest part of our job is when something goes wrong and we lose a, uh, an American life in this combat. Well, I, I don't know the answer, and I, I say that, you know, I've, I was in uniform from age 17 to, to uh, uh, th well, th essentially for 35 years. Uh, you're also talking to a guy whose daughter is a captain in the National Guard, and my son is an infantry major. Uh, so I'm very keenly aware of the threats to our uh, young people and their worldwide deployments. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. I think we ought to tell them. Are we going to sink the sink needs triple to sort the this training? Out. Huh? We're going to have double or triple the training well, I don't folks. Know. Uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to let the sink get the mission, right. do the planning. Right now it runs between 80 and 200 people in country. I can't imagine we're talking a substantial increase. That is a, it, principally a mobility package, and it's two more battalion training packages. So I wouldn't imagine the in-country footprint would be uh, very large. But I'd rather have the sink design the answer than me uh, wing it. Thank you. Yield to the uh, gentlelady from Hawaii, our ranking member. I uh, thank the chairman. And again, your testimony, General McCaffrey, has been uh, very enlightening. The first chart that you showed the committee at the hearing had to do with the cocaine production and the very dramatic uh, <clears throat> reductions in both Peru and Bolivia in production as well as in cultivation. Uh, my question <clears throat> goes to uh, the um, remarkable results that have been achieved by these two countries. And I assume from what I know about the alternate development uh, programs that were instituted by both countries, that there was not a large infusion of military equipment or military personnel that achieved these results. Could you explain what the American policy or American participation was, the cost of it, which so dramatically changed the uh, situation in both of those two countries? Um, it's, um, of course, let me, if I can, start by underscoring the enormous difference among these nations. And I, I know you're aware of it, and all of you in the committee are, but. Uh, they just have very different legal traditions, social organizations, the military, the police, judicial systems are unlike each other uh, throughout these 34 nations. I mean, they don't even speak the same languages. In these cases, they, they do. So uh, the historical context is quite different. Now, having said that, let me also assure you, we put a lot of money into B Bolivia and Peru. We put a billion dollars into Bolivia over the space of eight years, and it paid off didn't pay off, though, into the last three years, and we had the political will, the national conversation that Bonzer and Caroga engineered, uh, which uh, then allowed some very effective use of police and military who reinserted themselves in the Shapari and who then combined it with very intelligent use of alternative economic aid tied to a reward-punishment system. Up until then, we've been paying people to not grow cocaine, and that doesn't work. Uh, in Peru, we had some, I think, brilliant leadership by uh, President Fujimori and his people. Uh, they went after the political basis of the Sendero Luminoso. They did use military and police power with incredible effectiveness. Uh, we did support them. I personally was the commander-in-chief, U.S. Southern Command. We began the air bridge into Peru. Peru, Colombia. We used U.S. intelligence assets, AWACS, U.S. Navy, uh, ground training uh, groups to reinforce their police, the Umapar police out in the Wyaga Valley. And it paid off much more effectively, to be honest, than I anticipated. I was astonished. Uh, and that's why I'd rather give the credit to the Peruvians necessarily than to us. But we put a lot of assets into it. Now, Colombia is a different thing. 
Colombia is a giant country with trackless jungles and rivers for highways with a huge armed insurgency of people who, in many of our viewpoints, have walked from ideology to banditry and who are now fighting over huge flows of money. And to them, that's worth fighting over. And we've got a democratic government, a, a pretty decent democratic government with great traditions of military subservience to the uh, to civilian institutions, and they're in an emergency situation. So this package is our best thinking on how to support Plan Columbia, which they put together. That's the differences, Madam Congresswoman. On, uh, <clears throat> in your printed testimony on page four, you have a um, listing of the five strategic issues that President Pastrana uh, has incorporated in his $7.5 billion Plan Columbia. Now, uh, do you have a uh, monetary uh, dis distribution of that $7.5 billion in each of the five areas, for instance, in the peace process, in the uh, Colombian economy, in the reform of the justice system, and on democratization and social development? The, uh, what would be the uh, distribution mm. of that $7.5 putting aside the counter-drug strategy, which is item number three. Yeah. Uh, the Colombians, of course, came up with that plan, and I, I would call it a conceptual framework as opposed to detailed plans. I, I don't think they have an adequate answer. They've got to go get some of that money, as an example, in the European Union, in the IEDB, in the World Bank. And, uh, well, as I understand other. it, they have commitments of loans sure. from various international Pretty good. groups. Pretty good. Right. I think it's $1.3 billion, if I remember, they've already got. But they, they haven't fleshed out either the resources uh, for sure nor the, the details of their planning. Having said that, take our piece of it as an example. Uh, of that $1.6 billion, uh, last year the U.S. total, about 5 percent of it was in non-interdiction, non-intelligence, non-police military activities, 5 percent of it. This package we sent over to you, it goes up to 20 percent. It's got a $240 million package in there for alternative economic development, development of the judicial system, reform of the prison system, the peace process, et cetera. So our own U.S. funds are clearly a greatly increased weighting toward these other areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to recognize now the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Burton. General McCaffrey, let me just start off by saying uh, I have uh, been uh, quite critical in the past of uh, many of the things that uh, has not been done and some of the things that you said, but I want to tell you your presentation today was very impressive. Uh, it uh, sounds like we're on the right track, and I want to compliment you uh, for, uh, for what you said today. Now, if we just follow through, I think it'll be great. I do have a couple of comments I'd like to make, though, for the record, uh, and I'd like to ask a couple of questions. First of all, uh, you said that uh, the, the Blackhawks take 10 months to uh, produce, and uh, I think that's probably an accurate statement. Uh, the, the, the problem is to get the Blackhawks that we need to get down there in a proper time frame, uh, they prob Sikorsky probably can't get them produced that fast. Why don't we, and I, and I want to read to you something that was said back in uh, September of 1996. This is an exchange before the International Operations Com uh, Committee. Uh, I was uh, talking to uh, Colonel Calante, and it went like this. Uh, is that President Clinton calling you there? Uh, I said, I don't understand this. If new Black Hawks are required and the drug war is as important to the United States of America as we all know that it is, why couldn't we use some of the Black Hawks that are already in our arsenal to send to Columbia in lieu of the new ones until they arrive? I mean, don't we have any Black Hawks available? If we don't have any Black Hawks that are already produced in our arsenal, why not, Colonel? And Colonel Glanty said, I'm afraid I can't speak for the Army. I wear a purple suit working for the DSAA, but the decision to do that would have to be made by the Chief of Staff of the Army, and it hasn't been posed to him. I went on to say, I'm posing it right now. If we're talking about the need for 11 Blackhawks to assist in the war against drugs against the drug cartel and the communists down there who are supporting them, 
why in the world can't we take the Blackhawks that are currently in existence in the Army and send them down there and replace them as new ones come online? Why should we wait six months to a year? The war is going on right now. And he said he would take that under advisement and work on it. That was in 1996, and of course, we haven't done that. Uh, also, I'd like to comment on, uh, in 1996, the White House promised that uh, the House International Relations Committee that they would send 12 Huey II's down there and six Blackhawks. Uh, as of this year, the Huey II's have not been sent, and three of the Blackhawks have been sent down, which we referred to previously. So what I'd like to ask you, General, after saying what I said earlier about uh, uh, the plan you've talked about today sounds, uh, sounds very good, why can't we take out of the military arsenal some of the Blackhawks that we already have send them down there along with Huey twos that we probably have so that they can get started as quickly as possible rather than waiting for new ones to be produced by Sikorsky. Yeah. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, I spent all my life organizing machinery, people, spare parts, etc. cetera. And um, the, the most important thing you get out of that background is you gotta do a system. You can't just send machinery. You got to train the crews. You have to train. The hardest part is getting the ma maintenance system set up in advance of deploying machinery. You have to build the hangars, and the lead times on f learning to fly a Black Hawk helicopter is an 18-month proposition. So when we get ahead of ourselves, when we send six Black Hawks to the Colombian Army, which we did several years ago, they now have, as you know, 20, 28 total in the force. I flew in there and looked at them painting over the $100,000 plus radar reflective paint job so they could get Ejército de Colombia on the tail boom, borrowing pilots from the Colombian Air Force to put them in a Colombian Army uniform so they'd have their own helicopters. The program we're now uh, doing, I can assure you we're not going to do that. So we just got the hangar built for the Blackhawks. That's a $6 million flying machine. When you do the advanced phase maintenance, you've got to have a hangar. And we're just now getting trained uh, people online. Some of those UH-1N aircraft down there have contract pilots. And uh, by the way, you can't just crank these guys out even at 18 months and put a bunch of new kids behind the control of a $6 million plane that flies at night as effectively as it does in the daytime. That's the answer. Now, the drawdown authority, um, I couldn't, um, I wouldn't substitute my judgment for Secretary of Defense, but we need to be very careful. We did a lot of thinking about this hearing, Mr. Chairman, in the last several days. The drawdown authority as a tool to support U.S. foreign policy interests is about over. We're going to have to be very careful about this entire program. When the U.S. Armed Forces cut itself by a third in structure, or more, we had plenty of equipment that was available to use for other purposes. But we are now down at the point where our ability to deter attack in, in the Korean Peninsula, in the Gulf, in the peacekeeping operations is seriously strained. So again, drawdown authority is for the Secretary of Defense to decide, do well, we accept the risk of handing over U.S. Armed Forces material? Let, let me just follow up on that. Uh, I think that this is a, a problem of military significance to the United States right now. And uh, I certainly would, want, would not want to diminish our ability to protect the United States in the event we had a, a problem in, in two theaters and other parts of the world as we're supposed to be prepared to do. But I do think that uh, uh, since this problem is getting worse and worse by the day down there, and the FARC guerrillas and others are growing rapidly and they're getting tremendous resources from the drug cartels, I think it's imperative that we move as rapidly as possible while at the same time making sure that we have qualified personnel to use this equipment and, and, and if it's possible to get helicopters down there, Black Hawks and Huey Twos quicker and get people trained quicker, more quickly. Uh, I, I think that uh, that's something that uh, you and others ought to take a serious look at. I would just uh, urge you to do that and with that, once again, uh, I thought your presentation was very good today and since I've been so critical in the past, it's uh, time I uh, threw a few accolades at you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll, we'll look very carefully at your notion of accelerating the delivery of this equipment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you. I'd like to yield now to the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you very much. I'm going to try some questions, the general, as long as the voice holds out. I know you must be beside yourself with joy over being congratulated by the chairman. But, uh, let me just ask you a question. There are some, uh, including the former ambassador to El Salvador and Paraguay, who think that what we're doing here is uh, simply having a, uh, a policy of interfering in another country's civil war. And in fact, I'd like to get your reaction to that. Are we not just uh, saying on the one hand that we're going after uh, narcotics when in fact we're involving ourselves in a dispute that's some 40 years old? Well, I think not. I think the, the responsibility for sorting these questions out belong in Colombian hands, not U.S. We've got a, a responsible, uh, thoughtful, democratic government we're dealing with, the Colombians. Uh, they're in absolute misery. I mean, I, some of these numbers, it astonishes me that the American people haven't yet learned of the cost to Colombia of this drug problem. And I took into account the comments of one of your committee members earlier that it starts with the money we spend on illegal drugs. But, you know, the, a half million of these poor people have fled the country in the last several years. We've got brain drain going on in Colombia. Maybe that's to the advantage of the United States and, and Spain and the other places are going in Canada. Uh, internally, there's many as a million people in the last decade who have lost their homes because of the savagery that comes out of this drug issue. Uh, it's, it's impacted on the economy. It's in, imperiled uh, the, the ability of the government to have elections. One of the districts in Bogota couldn't elect a mayor because they were so intimidated by the thought of getting murdered by FARC operatives. It's right in the national capital. So I think the Colombians have suffered enormously. We, in my view, and the, her regional partners deserve to support them, not just with police and military, and intelligence and interdiction and precursor chemicals and arms control uh, for smuggling, but also with economic aid and political goodwill. Okay. I, your point's a good one. Well, it generally strikes some people as odd if, if our intention then is to really just focus on uh, narcotics and not to be involved in a civil war, why it is that we seem to be focused pretty much exclusively on FARC uh, and that entity and to the exclusion of the paramilitaries. You talked about displacement, but credible sources indicate that 47% of the displacement is created by paramilitaries, 35% uh, probably by the guerrillas, uh, about 8% in fact from the Colombian Armed Forces. Uh, human rights and international humanitarian law violations in 1999 were accredited 78% to the paramilitaries and 20% to guerrillas and 2% to state security forces. In fact, there's, there's significant evidence that a lot of the Colombians uh, don't see a great distinction between the Colombian military and police and the paramilitaries. And if we wanted to have a credible policy that really looked like we were going after narcotics and not after interference in a, in a uh, dispute, internal dispute, wouldn't we want to put some condition on this that the government would in fact not just tell us they're going to do this as they've done in the past, but actually do something about the paramilitaries? Because I think the evidence is overwhelming that there's been some collusion between the military and the police and the paramilitaries and people in Colombia. Frankly, I don't think they're gonna have a lot of faith that just sending this money down there so heavily lopsided towards military uh, intervention is going to be much comfort to them. Uh, I think your your point on the on these AUC uh, quote self defense units are is entirely correct. I mean these are some of the most brutal people imaginable. I mean the level of violence in Colombia is beyond imagination for Americans. The murder rates up over ninety per hundred thousand per annum. Ours, which is to, which is shameful, is around eight per hundred thousand per annum. Uh, and a lot of that mayhem does come out of these so-called paramilitary forces. I think you're quite correct. Um, it is my own view that, um, that the support we're providing to Colombian democratic institutions, to the CNP, to the armed forces, will be used to provide the rule of law in southern Colombia. And uh, I think they'll use it against the AUC, who are clearly involved in the drug business themselves, to include directly, in one occasion at least, running a laboratory. These are criminals. They've attacked the Colombian police and murdered them. They had a death threat on President Pastrana. Was the paramilitary groups. Well, ought we not get more of an assurance that they will, in fact, uh, go after those in an even-handed manner? I don't see anything in this package that gives me the comfort uh, that they're going to take as aggressive a stand against the paramilitaries and break some of that 
uh, cooperation that various people have had in the past. I mean, I know there have been isolated incidents where they have stood up in some progress, but ought we not to have any of the aid that we send down there, conditions that make it uh, really clear to us and give us a comfort level that they're in fact going to go after those paramilitaries? Because I, I feel for sure, General, that the people that live in that country, as terrorized as they are, really don't make a distinction right now. Uh, between yeah. what's going on with the government, uh, military, and the police, and the paramilitaries, and they're not going to be greatly comforted that we're giving more money. Let to me, them. if I may, though, your point's a good one. I essentially <clears throat> agree. We have to fully comply with the Leahy Act. We have to be uh, we have to be observant, not of rhetoric, but watch what are they doing. We need to vet units. Uh, we need to listen to the human rights community. Um, I, I will d report out to them when I come back from Columbia next week. Uh, I think your point's a good one. Now, having said that, if I may, let me strongly, though, put on the table an observation. The Colombian people do not uh, have a problem distinguishing between the FARC, the paramilitaries, and the police and the armed forces. There is, by any measure of polling or, or knowing these people, there is overwhelming support for the police, the army, the Catholic Church, and democracy. There is, the last poll I saw was around 6% for the paramilitary and around 3% for the FARC. The FARC and these units are terrorists. They're not going to win at the ballot box. They're trying to win through uh, savagery. But the people do not feel that way. Uh, they, they, there is a tremendous respect for the police and democratic institutions. They voted at risk of their lives the last election. And the FARC did not, does not credibly play in that process, never mind these criminal paramilitary units. General, I, th I think there's been a remarkable indication that the people in Colombia have one thing they can do is organize and pull together. And there have been uh, that we show some signs through the reallocation of the different allocation of this money uh, by more support to uh, cro alter crop alternatives to ways to get that crop to market, to the roads, to things of that nature. Shouldn't we build their confidence uh, by putting more of the money in, uh, in that direction than by putting it to the, uh, to the military uses, which I still say, despite your remarks, which I, uh, I give you due credit for, for them, but I have other people telling me different things, and they're fairly credible also, that there's a concern by a great number of people down there that the fact that the government and the paramilitary still are. Uh, engaged in, in supporting one another, and I think we need to build support and have this package be conditioned uh, on some of these things like better support for the judicial system, better assurances that there'll be civil trials, uh, and that as people will be pursued, that the outstanding warrants will in fact be enforced, and that people will be able to get their crops to market and be able to safely reclaim some of their lands or at least go out and pioneer new lands uh, with support on that. And I think that I'd like to hear your discussion about why we can't condition uh, this aid on those types of situations. Well, I, I think uh, fundamentally, uh, this, the program we sent down to you doesn't make sense unless you see $7.5 billion. There is a, in our view, a coherent, well thought out Colombian plan to take all these issues into account. And then in addition, even within our $1.6 billion piece, as I mentioned, there's a massive increase in alternative economic development support, support for the judicial system, prison reform, et cetera, the peace process. It's a $240 million package that's in there. And it's gone up from 5% to 20% of the total, notwithstanding, in addition, the World Bank loans, et cetera. Now, finally, I think going back to what it is we're, we're asking you to consider, this is a mobility package to reinsert in the coca growing regions of the South democratic control. That's what that is. And when I fly into Trace Esquinas, I can assure you, sir, there is no democratic control down there. This is five FARC fronts armed to the teeth, and they are fighting for heroin production and cocaine production, which is killing Americans and Venezuelans and Colombians all throughout the hemisphere. That's what we're doing. We're going after the production of heroin and cocaine in southern Colombia and giving them a mobility and the training they need to do their job. Then let me just end then, please, General, by suggesting that we, when we attack country by country like that, doesn't it just move the supply from one country to another, from Southeast Asia to Peru, from Peru to Colombia, from Colombia to where now if we do this? 
Well, I think your point's a, a good one. We need to be concerned about that. There, ho there ought to be a regional approach. You're quite correct. Um, at the same time, we ought to be happy that <coughs> Thailand, in 15 years with our help, has worked itself into a situation where it is 1% of Southwest Asian heroin production. And they got a tremendous treatment system. Th things are better off in a long-standing ally, Thailand, because of our support. Pakistan has largely eliminated drug production. This is working in Peru and Bolivia, and we ought to be happy for them. The problem we're now focusing on is Colombia and its spillover effect. I think you're quite correct. We have to keep our eye on a regional responsibility to confront this evil. But at the same time, we've got to remember what we're doing. This is devastating in its impact on America. Those are 520 metric tons of cocaine that will come out of Colombia. And by the way, they have a huge drug abuse problem, and it's growing, to include heroin addiction. And Dr. Nelba Chavez and I went there the last time. We went right to a drug treatment facility for children to underscore our concern for their kids. And those drugs are all over Western Europe, Spain, Amsterdam, Russia. I guess my only point was it, it was no less of a concern to this country and other places when it was in Peru or Bolivia. Uh, and we still have it with us today after decreasing the situation in those countries. We now have it in Colombia. Yeah. And my concern is... You know, we go down there and we use the military. We do all of this in Colombia, and where next? Well, your, we your concern is a correct one. Demand. Let me also, though, if I can leave on the table, in three years, there has been a net reduction in cocaine production in the world of 7%. It was 11% last year, and this explosion in Colombia has changed it. So there is actually a lot less cocaine killing somebody's children and, and destroying the, the workforce than there were three years ago. This is actually working. We got to stay at it for 10 years, I would agree. And we got to watch the regional total, not just go to one spot and think we can find the Schweinfurt ball bearing factory of the drug business. It doesn't exist. I think you're quite correct. Like the uh, gentleman, I might just say that uh, one of the things that we did with Mr. Hastert uh, was when we went down into uh, Peru and Bolivia several years mm -hmm. ago was to help start those programs for crop eradication and uh, crop substitution. And they have been very effective. We do, have done it also with the UN, and we co-sponsored last week's summit with the UN uh, with Pino Arlaki, uh, and they have been very successful in that effort. The first thing that we needed, though, in Peru was stability. Uh, I remember going to Peru nine years ago and uh, bombs going off, you could not have any crop substitution eradication programs so you had stability. And there are only so many places you can produce cocaine. Uh, uh, and uh, this summit last week also pledged to uh, participate in the eradication, if you can believe this, of cocaine production in Bolivia within the next year, year and a half. Uh, so it can be done, but you do need the stability uh, a joint effort, and in this case, an international effort. Uh, just wanted to interject that and now recognize the uh, gentleman uh, who chairs our International Relations Committee, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General McCaffrey, uh, I was looking over your chart in support for the Plan Columbia, and I note that uh, Colombian National Police uh, get only receive only 95 million of that proposal out of 1.5 or 1.6 billion dollar uh, proposal. Why are we giving such a small amount to the Colombian National Police, who've demonstrated uh, an excellent record in achieving uh, a reduction in uh, cocaine and reduction in heroin? and have been doing a courageous effort. Uh, and the military apparently is getting close to 600 million for a push into southern Colombia. Why is there such an inequitable distribution between the police and the military? Um, you're quite correct in your uh, confidence and respect for the Colombian police and in General Serrano's leadership and in these, uh, these field combat units. They're the police, the Dante, some 2,500. Uh, and they are equipped with uh, now 47 aircraft. Uh, they've got a decent, pretty decent mobility uh, capability. Uh, but there's 2,500 of them, and there's 26,000 people organized with heavy mortars 
helicopters, aircraft. Uh, they're using essentially chemical weapons. The 30-man detachments of the Colombian National Police are not who will intervene at Trace Esquinas and go out and start operating against coca cultivation. Last year, the Colombians had more than 25 aircraft hit by ground fire. This is incredibly dangerous work. They've got to get, in our judgment, supporting the Colombian thinking, they've got to get the riverine forces down there to control the lines of communication. They've got to get mobility down there, and they've got to put at least three, if not more, counter-narcotics battalions of the Army, and then allow the police to go in and time that with alternative economic development, so we're not just driving people off the land. That's what we're trying to do. In addition, last year, we put $350 million into Colombia, and since we uh, did not have the same confidence that we have now in the General Tapia's leadership, Minister of Defense Ramirez and others, this almost all went to the police. So I think this is a balanced program that well, will General serve their country. Uh, General Serrano has been pleading for Black Hawk helicopters so he can get to the higher altitudes and eradicate the heroin crop, the poppy crop. And he's said that had he have, if he's given the wherewithal to do that, he can eliminate that crop within a two-year period. How many Black Hawks have we delivered to General Serrano to do this work. How many does he now have from our nation available to do the kind of thing that he wants to do to eradicate the heroin crop? Well, um, he's got 47 aircraft. I'm uh, asking about Black Hawks, He's General. got uh, six Black Hawks. He's got uh, three more en route. Um, let, me, let me just tell you, Mr. Congressman, I, you know, I've done this kind of thing my entire life. I would not substitute my judgment for Minister of Defense Ramirez. There's 240,000 people in the armed forces of Colombia, and they control the national police also. The same minister has both sides of it. I did sit there with the president of their republic, with their minister of defense, with their foreign minister. This is their plan. And by the way, it makes a lot of sense to me. We do not wish to take the Colombian National Police and turn them into a force capable of engaging in open combat with the FARC fronts. I'm not suggesting cocaine. that, General McCaffrey. I'm just suggesting that let's give General Serrano the wherewithal to do what he wanted to do, and that's to eliminate the heroin crop, the, the poppy crop. And we've, all, we've only given them, to my understanding, th three Blackhawks that are operable and three that are not operable at the present time. Le I I'm saying, let's give, and I'm not saying detract the funding from uh, the military, give them what they need to do something in the southern uh, area of Colombia, but also at the same time, let's make certain we're not shortchanging the Colombian anti-drug police who've been doing such an outstanding job and can do an even better job. And it looks to me like we're concentrating on the military and forgetting the anti-drug police. And I hope that you take another look at that yeah. and make certain there'd be a little more equity in the distribution of those important funds. Both are trying to do the important work. Serrano has demonstrated he can do it. And I want to make certain that we're going to not neglect uh, that aspect of the funding. Let me ask you. Well, let me, let me, if I can, just say President Pastrana assured us that the Colombian National Police budget would be more than adequate to fulfill their tasks. And I think, well, let's just watch and see what happens. I think that's the case. Well, I hope we're not going to do more of watching and less of actual support that is sorely needed. What's the average operating rate to the six Army Blackhawks that have been delivered? Isn't um, it less than 40 percent? The six Army, Columbian Army? Yes, six Army Black I don't have a, uh, an answer for you. Well, I we'll provide it for the record. It's less than 40 percent. How many Black Hawk pilots does the Colombian Army have? Isn't it true that they're using civilian pilots to fly the old uh, UH? Uh, Mr. Gilman, that is precisely what I tried to uh, walk through. We need a system approach. They don't have a maintenance system, a training system, the hangars 
to rapidly absorb the most modern technology in the face of the earth. And yet we're offering them 30 Blackhawks. They don't have the uh, maintenance uh, operability. We'll have a plan over the coming years that will provide a trained, maintained, balanced force to support their army. That's what we'll, how, that's what we'll have to achieve. How long will it take us to do that, General? Well, I mean, it takes 18 months to get a Black Hawk pilot. It takes 10 months to build a plane. It takes two to five years to put together a credible system. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll be working at it for a long time. Well, at the same time, don't the uh, anti-narcotic police have 150 trained chopper pilots? They're now... The, the, uh, they're the now Columbia National Police do not have a system to support a sudden infusion of Black Hawks, period. It doesn't exist. Matter of fact, were I the president of Columbia, I would not be putting Black Hawks in the Air Force, the Army, the police, and anywhere else. I wouldn't do it. They've elected to do that, and we're going to have to support them in making it happen. Were I the president of Columbia, they'd all be in the Air Force in one spot. Uh, but we'll, we'll support their own thinking. We'll have to do it in a very judicious way, and I'll bet we pull it off if we get sink U.S. Southern Command engaged in monitoring this But you're process. talking about a two-year period. In the oh, meantime, it's longer than that. Pardon? I think it'll be longer than that. You're, you're looking at a uh, 30 Blackhawks, 33 UH-1H. They're going to buy 17 more Blackhawks beyond that. They're buying... Uh, How long will that take to put, make them operable? Well, I mean, they'll, ha they'll have to go in only when we see a laydown of a system that can absorb them. Are we, how right. many years are we talking about to make this operation uh, uh, Well, the, the part of it that I'm here to brief you on is two years. In the meantime, though, the drug police are operable and can use a few more Blackhawks put into place. They can achieve success and not wait two or three years. Well, we'll look very carefully at your own viewpoint, Mr. Gilman. I would Thank hope you, you for would. That. Uh, I was quite distur distressed to read in recent news reports that President Pastrana was quoted as saying that the fugitive FARC commander who ordered the brutal execution of three Americans would not be extradited to the United States. Is our administration going to press Pastrana on that issue? Do you feel that extradition would interrupt the peace negotiations between the Colombian government and the FARC? Um, I don't know the uh, status of an extradition request for that person. But I'd be glad to provide it for the record. Each one of these are, are by name two attorney generals. I don't know what the status is of that extradition. That doesn't come within your purview as our drugs are? Well, the first extradition in 10 years uh, from Colombia just occurred. We're very encouraged by that. We actually extradited a Colombian citizen charged with drug-related offenses. So it's, it's a tremendous statement of courage in the part of the Colombians. They finally did that. And we think there's 30 more targets of the Millennium Operation that we're now after. We want those 30 people out and we're getting very courageous support from the Colombians about this. You need to talk to Mr. Ledwith, one of the most brilliant law enforcement operations I know of was Operation Millennium. Six nations, and we're going to try and extradite many of those subjects. Well, I would hope that you would continue to pressure uh, President Pastrana in that direction. I think it affects our whole strategy of what we're doing in Colombia and make certain that we get cooperation from him. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think we have time for two more members. There are two votes coming up. I'm going to run the clock. Uh, Ms. Schakowsky, you're recognized, and then we'll catch one from the other side. Thank First you. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I'd like unanimous consent to include in the record an article by Robert White that appeared in the... Uh, Without objection, so ordered. And also, um, I wanted to ask, because I have so, so many questions, if the record could be open so I could submit some in writing. Uh, without objection, we'll keep the record open for... Two weeks. Thank you very much. Um, General McCaffrey, I, my unease about this whole um, plan is uh, revolves around three areas. One is the, our objective. When I look at the materials that you've presented and listen to your testimony here today, I have to ask you, what is 
our objective in Colombia? What are the specific measurements of that? And how do we know when we have achieved victory? Now I hear you talking about a much longer term plan. It seems to me we only have this, the most general of overviews. I included in that are questions, of how many lives are we willing to say are, are, are worth it? How much money are we willing to continue to, um, to put in? Um, how many additional people is it sat satisfactory to have displaced within uh, within Colombia? You said you don't know how many American troops um, will be dedicated or even put at risk in this plan. Aren't those things that need to be clearly spelled out? Our objectives and how we know if we have we have achieved them. What are the benchmarks? Well, I think you're quite correct. Uh, there's, there's no question. You just outlined our challenge. Um, by law, uh, two years ago, uh, the Congress told me to devise the performance measures of effectiveness. This is it, and there's a classified annex. And we actually have very specific targets that we're trying to achieve in the Andean Ridge and in Colombia. And they're measurable. And we know what we're trying to achieve, and that's to eliminate uh, 520 metric tons of cocaine and six metric tons of heroin and a criminal organization which is causing devastating impact on our regional partners. And there are ways to go about determining whether we're achieving our purpose or not. And as I tried to uh, suggest, uh, it is achievable. This is not a hopeless proposition. And when we do it, we ought to not just go after police and military. There ought to be a broader Colombian and regional strategy to take into account the immense suffering of the people. I think that's exactly what we have to achieve. We have to be able to tell Congress that that's what's happening over the coming years. I want to ask you about the push into southern Colombia. As you pointed out, this is an enormous country. We're talking about a, a region the size of California, ten, uh, uh, 20 times the size of El Salvador. And, and by the way, I just wanted to point out that one of the uh, observations that Robert White made was that we should recall that Quote, in El Salvador, our bloody, divisive, 12-year pursuit of military victory proved fru fruitless. We finally settled for a U.N. broker accord that granted the guerrillas many of, of their demands. Um, and, and by the way, he also points out that the Colombian military has no experience in carrying uh, the war to the insurgents. So we're talking about a, a huge area, and we're focusing in on uh, Putumayo and Caqueta departments in southern Colombia, where two-thirds of the coca is now grown. But since the Am Amazon basin is so huge, what is to say that when we focus there, maybe even succeed there, that it won't simply move to another part of the Amazon basin, and that we'll be just where we were, and even further now into what has been characterized by some as a Vietnam-like quagmire? Yeah. Well, I think those are all uh, legitimate concerns. I, I would argue strongly that uh, <laughs> Colombia is not El Salvador. Colombia isn't Mexico. Colombia isn't Vietnam. These are not useful historical or, or uh, metaphorical analogies. Uh, there are 36 million Colombian people involved in abject misery, much of which is driven by the massive production of cocaine and heroin, which is fueling an internal struggle that's now devolved into sheer savage banditry. And it is our view that we should, we, meaning the regional partners, ought to stand with elected Colombian Democratic officials with a broad gauge support of alternative economic development, support for judicial systems, as well as support for the police and army. So I basically agree with your concerns. Uh, it is not hopeless. Uh, they can push into southern Colombia. There is no shortage of courage in Colombia. There is no shortage of political will to rid themselves of something that's unraveling their economy and threatening the peace process. Why would you talk if you're a FARC front that's getting hundreds of millions of dollars a year out of the drug cartels? Taxation, though it may be, they're taxing them in the growing fields, taxing them in the laboratories, and taxing them down the riverine systems. The FARC and the Dispehe 
are acting with outrageous impunity. I can't imagine politically why they're doing this. So are you saying... They're causing the campesinos to begin growing coca. So are you saying until there's a demonstrable military victory and control of the, the South, then there is no hope of, of peace, and that, that will be one measure that, of our I progress? I think it's the viewpoint of the Colombian leadership that as long as the drug money is fueling the FARC, the ELN, and these paramilitary criminal organizations... Which are hardly mentioned in this plan. Well, I, I, I'm not sure uh, that that's the case. The Colombian police and the, and the mayors and the journalists are cognizant of the tremendous threat posed by all those units, as well as somebody that's... <coughs> obviously the heart and soul of these criminal organizations, these literally hundreds of criminal groups uh, that are actually producing the drugs and moving them up into the United States. But that's what that support is designed to achieve, is to knock those people out. What are they after? They're going to chop down the coca and chop down the opium poppies. And to get in there, you can't have 2,500 cops go south and do that. It is worth your life at El Bilar a couple of years ago, they sent one of their elite counterinsurgency battalions out, and they lost the whole battalion. This is big business down there. This is a high-threat environment. It's driven by drug money. I'm going to quit now. I know. Can I? Can I just say, um, Mr. Chairman, that the yes. questions that I will submit also deal with. Um, You've talked about how democratic the Colombian government is, but I wanted to raise some questions, and I'll do that in, in writing. Well, this is about very important, and I'm going to impose on the general. We're going to vote uh, right now, and then we'll come back. I have Mr. Souter and two others that want to. I've got to uh, leave for the great state of Wyoming uh -huh. to address a joint session of the legislature and meet the governor and state authorities. So we'll so be back here in. Fifteen minutes start promptly, and I will have you out uh, five minutes apiece at five minutes of one. This uh, meeting stands in recess. I'd like to call the uh, subcommittee back to order. Uh, the uh, director has limited time. We'll go in uh, availability of members arrive, arriving. Although he's not a member of our subcommittee, he is chairman of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee of the House. Uh, Mr. Bellinger, re you're recognized for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like the opportunity, if I may, Mr. General McCaffrey, to ask a question, uh, is the administration wedded to the 30 Blackhawks? Uh, what I'd like to do is, I think you probably know the numbers, but they cost about $14 million each. QE2s, which uh, are rebuilt QE, old QEs are, uh, I've ridden in one, and it's, it seems to have close to the same capabilities uh, as a Blackhawk, and they only cost $1,400,000, so somewhere along there you can get seven or eight of these QE2s for the same price as one Blackhawk. Uh, if you were to, and not only that, the delivery time on a Blackhawk, as you have already admitted, is 18 months, whereas a QE2, I think they could start delivering in July at the present time. They also have the maintenance capabilities in uh, Columbia for this, and pilot training uh, is much simpler for the QE2s. And, as far as I can tell, uh, you might be able to cut down on the total number of, of uh, helicopters and supply something for the uh, peaceful purposes or, shall we say, crop alternatives and so forth. Uh, could you react to that uh, statement? Well, of course, the um, uh, Colombian armed forces and police are uh, trying to control a, a, a giant country with 240,000 people, very few of whom. You look at the Colombian police, probably have 2,500 people they can move around. The Colombian army may have uh, 30,000, generously. And uh, they need range, they need altitude, they need lift capabilities. Uh, I can assure you, sir, a Huey II is not the same as a Blackhawk. Uh, and I won't go into my ode to the Blackhawk, but it is a, uh, an incredible piece of day-night machinery uh, with the kind of range that I think will be required uh, to get back into the south. 
Uh, they will have a mixed fleet, though, and, there, and we uh, thir there are 33 UH-1Ns in, in there, and they will be it, rebuilt. Is it not true that UH-1N is a pretty old piece of equipment already, that it was used and we bought it from Canada, and, and its capabilities are nowhere near what a UE-2s are? Well, I think um, you should probably ask, the SYNC will have a more informed viewpoint on this than I will. Uh, the UH-1Ns out of Canada were in pretty good shape. They will be refurbished. They're going to provide a a tremendous and more immediate uh, responsive capability. But at the same time, I think the 28 Blackhawks, they already have the 30 that we are proposing they receive, and the 17 additional that they will purchase uh, will give them a modest capability to try and reinsert uh, democratic institutions in the south of Columbia. Well, in, just in moving the, the troops, the battalions that we're speaking of in, in the south, uh, if it takes 18 months to get the first Black Hawk, uh, are we sure that uh, the Colombians are still going to be there 18 months from now, whereas uh, on the yeah. Huey 2s you can get delivery in almost a couple of months? And not only that, uh, the numbers that you can get for the, the taxpayer's dollar, let's put it that way, uh, you could get numbers to be able to move a battalion much more rapidly than you could with the Black Hawk. I realize there's some differences in, in lift capabilities, but uh, the numbers that would be available at a rate of 10 to 1 in savings uh, yeah. is something worth looking at. Well, it has been very carefully analyzed. I think the program we sent over has a great deal of logic behind it. We, again, have been working on this for uh, just about a year. Um, we do have a time-space uh, lift uh, notion on what we can do to support them. Uh, there should be a mixed fleet. You're quite correct. We shouldn't just have pure fleet Blackhawks in the Columbia right now. There won't be a a delay of 18 months before something happens. Uh, there are Blackhawks there now. More will arrive in a deliberate fashion about as rapidly as the maintenance and spare parts. Can. Yeah, but when you say the maintenance and spare parts, that is your 18 months that you just said earlier it would take that long to train the pilots and train the maintenance and train uh, the various and sundry other parts. So that in reality, even though you have Blackhawks there and everybody knows that you have, mm -hmm. and not only that, the maintenance yeah. capabilities of a Blackhawk is understanding about 20% of the fleet. The question was asked earlier, what, what is the flying capability of that fleet uh, in operation? And I've understood that 20% uh, is pretty, pretty average for them. Oh, I wouldn't think so. I hope not. But, but, but that's certainly a concern. The Black Hawk helicopter, properly maintained in the contract, is a tremendously robust machine. You know, what these poor police and Colombian military units are trying to achieve, they get shot at all the time, up through 50 caliber weapons. Uh, uh, and they take hits, and the Black Hawk helicopter can absorb multiple hits. We've seen them take 20, 30 rounds and keep flying. It's, you put an armored kit on it, and we'll be able to save lives and, and achieve our purpose, which really is to destroy cocaine and heroin production affecting our own but country. One more question, if I may. Before we uh, finally get to the finish on this, this product, uh, and considering the number of votes that would be necessary to pass it, uh, I noticed a couple of uh, people on the other side of the aisle speaking about uh, funds for crop alternatives, more peaceful efforts, and so forth. To generate that, uh, again, the idea that you can get seven QE2s for the price of one Black Hawk, uh, with the same number of, of helicopters, maybe you needed a few more because of their lift capabilities, uh, you could generate some money that would might uh, get some peaceful uh, donations vote-wise on the other side of the aisle. Well, I think uh, that we ought to, we have tried to table a coherent, well thought out plan, and we ought to argue it, in my view, on its merits, every single sub element of it. And I think that the mobility package looks to be a pretty good one for, for this force. And again, to put it in perspective, uh, the entire package we're talking about is far less than one of the nine divisions in the Gulf War. We're a huge country, and for a force that you know, trying to confront a, a criminal institution that kills 52,000 people a year. That's really what we're after. Well, I can understand that, but I, again, I look at the viewpoint that uh, it might be that the, the taxpayers of the United States, in comparing the, the situation, might look more at the dollars than, uh, uh, in other words, why shouldn't a Ford be just as good as a Cadillac? Everybody though, uh, would argue the point that we'd rather have Cadillacs, but if you get a Ford tomorrow and you have to wait 18 months to get a Cadillac, which makes more sense? Well, of course, our, 
collective judgment. Uh, I hope the American people will have some confidence in it, uh, as well thought out as we could make it, was that this package represented a decent way to go about Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I uh, recognize now the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. I thank the chairman. And I wanted to make a, uh, a couple of points for the record. And I have a, a few questions, too. One is, is that there's been an unfortunate perception here, I think, that the FARC are some sort of romantic revolutionaries rather than drug thugs. They, they have become funded by uh, the drug movement, provided protection for the drug movement. And sometimes I think the general pointed out that there's less, 3 percent or less support for the FARC in the country. Sometimes I think there's more support here in Congress than there is in Colombia for the FARC. And it's a very disappointing uh, uh, process. As far as the right-wing paramilitary groups, if they don't get directly tied with, to drugs, then we would be intervening in a domestic conflict if they aren't tied to drugs. If they're tied to drugs, we ought to go after them just like we're going after the FARC and anybody else. Furthermore, the right wing is not an American concept. It's a neo-Nazi type right wing, which in my opinion is a left wing socialist type of approach too. So that don't, those who are watching this can get very confused by the rhetoric that's thrown around. Then uh, I wanted to pursue a little, because I, I take this a little personal, I know that the, uh, uh, we've had a long-term disagreement about the Black Hawk helicopter question regarding uh, funds for the CNP versus Peru and Bolivia. I offer this amendment, I believe, still when you were at Southcom, uh, General McCaffrey, and we, we then proceeded to argue this as more senior members took, took the amendment, the committee chairman and so on, over the years. But the truth is that in the context of the drug budget, given the president's limitations, taking the helicopters could be seen as taking the money from Peru and Bolivia. But we, de we asked for the designation to come from unobligated INL funds, which were being transferred to the Balkans. That was not the decision of the drug czar or the people even at the lower levels of the State Department who were dealing with narcotics. But to act like there was some kind of law that when we passed the Black Hawks, it meant that it came from Peru and Bolivia was not my intent or anyone else's intent in sure. Congress. I there was an administration-wide decision that the Balkans were a critical place to put our funds, funds from Latin or could, that could have been devoted to this problem in anti-drugs were diverted the AWACs were diverted, and that was a, a system-wide decision, not a drug policy decision. Uh, and, and I just want to say for the record, because this has been thrown around a number of times, implying that my intent in that amendment was to move it from Bolivia to Colombia. My intent was to say we had a national interest stake way back in 95, which you so eloquently told us in our first visit that, that I attended at Southcom in, in, around, I think it was early 96, with uh, uh, Congressman Zeliff and now Speaker Hastert. Then when General Clark was at Southcom, he warned us that we were in danger of losing Columbia and what was happening here. And then he went over to the Balkans uh, to command that. And now General Wilhelm has been telling us this isn't something new that we knew about. What is new is, is that the president of Columbia is now clean, that the, the defense minister is committed to reforming the defense department. Uh, General Tobias uh, in the military is committed to, to reform. That is new. Uh, but I wanted to, to clarify that too. Now, my, my two questions relate to uh, one, you made a reference to the Venezuelan overflights, and, and Congressman Ballinger and I, and Congressman Delahunt, and Congressman Farr met with President Chavez as well as our ambassador. And we're hopeful that we can work out some kind of procedures. It's a very delicate process with Venezuela. But there is no question that if we put this pressure on in Colombia, that Ecuador, which is clearly going through political transformations as well, uh, that's a kind way to say it, uh, and, and Venezuela, that we could push this problem out. And I would like to hear, and we'll ask the other panelists too, how we're going to deal in particular with Ecuador and Venezuela. We usually talk about Peru and Bolivia. And then the second thing is, is that you said that we went back and revised the data that came up with the kind of the, uh, this kind of emergency uh, process in Colombia. Could you explain why we didn't have that data earlier? What caused the revisions? And elaborate on that a little bit. The, um, um, I think your, your, your point on uh, the spillover effect in Venezuela and Ecuador is quite correct. And uh, uh, Under Secretary Pickering is in Venezuela today. Uh, we'll consult with the government. Uh, we are concerned. Um, I went into Venezuela and saw President Chavez and uh, presented uh, our uh, 
our, our worries about what was happening, I gave him a computer-generated DIA reproduction of airborne drug flights in and out of the Andean Ridge uh, prior to his change in air exclusion and since then. And it is unmistakable that Venezuela is being used uh, in a major way by international drug criminals coming out of southern Colombia and out dropping, uh, air dropping or air landing drugs in Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and to some extent up into uh, Central America. And we've got to do something about it. And, uh, we're, and it's a regional problem. It's not a Venezuelan and U.S. problem. It's one that affects uh, certainly Colombia's ability to air into deck. Those aircraft are going back in, loitering in their airspace, in some cases landing and waiting out the interdiction capability, which is coming out of Curacao, Aruba, and, and Roosevelt Road. So we've got to do something about it. And I hope we can, in a very respectful and, and transparent way, gain the support of Venezuelan authorities for a regional air interdiction solution. And Mr. Pickering will, will try and uh, continue that dialogue. Can I ask a direct follow-up while you're on that point? That um, when we met with General uh, President Chavez, I think he understands the nature of it. Clearly, there's a difficult domestic situation. He's made public statements that have made this very awkward, as we're finding in many other Latin American countries and South American countries, of how do we deal with the rising tide of nationalism in these countries. There seems to be some willingness to look at uh, if we'll help them put in new radar, train people to operate the radar, working with shared uh, uh, information, but it looks like we may be heading into some new uh, areas as we deal with some of these different countries. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we will not drive him away from us, but rather look how to be inclusive in the process. Well, I think you're quite correct. And I read the embassy cable out of your visit. And I think your own interventions were helpful to this process. And we'll have to see how we can move ahead. Um, but I think it's a uh, difficult situation right now that uh, is causing problems to regional drug, inter drug interdiction. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. The, the, the new data from, from the um, uh, one of the uh, most professional groups I deal with, and among many in the intelligence collection business, is CNC, and the basically it's run by the CIA, a brilliant group of uh, people. They've been uh, using satellite uh, photography for several decades now to analyze things on the ground. And one of them they've been following are crops, crop production estimates. And uh, so they're, as I suggested uh, to other people, when you look at this drug issue, data is a problem. There are islands of hard data. There are islands of uh, decent data where it's, if it's big, you're happy. If it drops, you're sad. And then there are extrapolations in some of these issues. One of the hard data is hectorage under cultivation. If it's outdoor growth of opium, uh, poppies, or marijuana, uh, or um, coca bushes, we're pho photographing it. We know essentially in a year to year whether it's going up or going down and where it is. And we put it on maps and give it to our allies. Uh, we did go in, and we, we're, we just finished doing this with Mexico uh, a week ago. And we did it with Columbia. We, uh, DEA lead, went in and, and tried to do a revised analysis of efficiency of laboratory process and alkaloid content of the plants. And it was a brilliant piece of work. Colombian intelligence system had to get in there and get crop samples all over the country. And we've done that very quietly in the last uh, several months. Out of that, uh, CNC then did a revised analysis of the 98 production and uh, came up with 400 plus metric tons. And so that we didn't have, in a historical sense, a big discontinuity with a footnote revised algorithm, they then ran it backwards for, I think, three or four years to, to say, and again, it was with assumptions, how quickly did these new, quote, industrial processes come into play? From mosh pits, they're now in 55-gallon drums, lacerating the leaves with weed whackers, packing them tightly, pouring kerosene on them, and getting much increased yields of cocaine. So that's what they did. And then we did an analysis of, F of the 99 data and uh, using the new algorithms as well as a new hectorage under cultivation and got a 20% increase in cultivation and a matching 20% probable output of cocaine out of the growing region. Really, first-rate work by the CIA, and DEA was very heavily involved also.
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Osi from California. I, if I heard correctly, it takes 10 months to build a helicopter, 12 months to build a hangar for the helicopter, and 18 months to train the pilots. And I wasn't quite sure if that meant the pilots and the ground crew on maintenance, which totals up to 40 months if you add it end to end. Are that'd, be, that'd be one classic stupid way to do it. Well, I was, I was going <laughs> to... You have to understand, I'm in, I'm in the federal government now, so I have, I'm obliged to ask that question. Well, I mean, that's a danger, though. You, you make a good point. You've got to do, you've got to see a system. You've got to start a PERT diagram process to have it all come together. And the last thing that happens is you roll Blackhawks off a plane. But you're quite correct. We have to be very prudent in how we go about this. Do we have the pilots for the Colombian National excuse me, the Colombian military or the poli national police being trained today pending the arrival of these Blackhawks? No. So in effect... I mean, there's a training program. First of all, let me defer if I can. Uh, the, the good answer to this question will come out of Ambassador Romero and the SYNC. They may have to do it for the record. But there is now, for this package of 63 aircraft, there will be a plan detailed to do all these things. But Congress has got to pass the money. I understand. And, th and then we'll make sure, though, that that kind of thinking is implicit in the delivery scheme. Okay, let me, let me revert then to the three helicopters that are in Columbia right now, the Blackhawks. There's actually 28 Blackhawks okay. there. there. There are three that are being used by the, uh, I can't remember, the military and national police that lack the armor, or at least lacked the armor, which had to be custom built for installation. Have those three helicopters received the custom armoring they need to fly into the Despeje? Well, uh, let me, uh, well, they, they're, they're not going to fly into the Despeje. They'd be they're used by the CNP probably to operate against uh, opium production in the, okay. up in the Andean Ridge up in the northeast. Um, we'll provide an answer for the record. I've got a note that says two out of the three do, but I. Let me just provide it for the record so you get exact data. All right. Uh, two other questions, if I might. Uh, I kind of like to look downstream and figure what I'm being asked to spend versus what the likely outcomes are if I don't spend the money. Uh, and I'm, this might be uh, relatively unfair, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Could you speculate on the future in Colombia? as it relates to the drug threat to the United States if we don't do this? Well, I think, um, Mr. Congressman, you, you make a, one point that we've got to take into account. Uh, this is not North Korea. Uh, this is not Myanmar. This is not far off Afghanistan. The drug production in Afghanistan is unbelievable. They're the number one heroin producing nation on the face of the earth. Uh, and that heroin is causing incredible damage in Western Europe and Russia and Ukraine and other places. But these people, the Colombians, are three hours flight from Miami and a half million have fled already. And, you know, maybe a million of these poor people have lost their homes and drug production's gone up 140 percent and violence is endemic. And they're a very important uh, economic partner to us. And they're uh, the fact that they're a democracy is vitally important to us. We don't want a narco state uh, right on our, on our doorsteps of the Gulf Coast and, and South Florida. So I think it is vitally important that we stand with their democratic leadership in the coming years. And oh, by the way, there's a spillover effect. This is directly affecting Panama. There are more than a thousand FARC guerrillas up in Adarian now. And the next thing we know, the paramilitary will follow, and the only losers will be the campesinos, in this case, Panamanians. They're across the border in safe areas in Ecuador. They're hijacking aircraft out of Venezuela. They're kidnapping ranchers. Uh, this is a regional threat to our Latin American neighbors and a direct threat to the United States. I'm trying to make sure I understand from where the direct threat originates. And what I hear you saying, it's coming from the narco-terrorists who are supporting 
either the FARC or the paramilitary units? Well, I think the, uh, the threat is the drugs. It's 520 metric tons of cocaine and six metric tons of heroin, and it contributes to mayhem in American society. Health costs, social costs, economic costs, criminal justice system. 52,000 dead a year. We had 48,000 dead in seven years of Vietnam. This is a huge deal for American society, and it's the drugs. And unfortunately, those drugs generate billions of dollars in profits. And that's causing destruction in democratic institutions throughout the hemisphere. That's a problem. Do we, last question, if I might. The, uh, some would suggest that we need to split our effort, if you will, between, say, the paramilitary units, the FARC, uh, teaching new cropping patterns, and what have you. What's the number one priority in your estimation? Well, I think from a U.S. perspective, it's been quite uh, straightforward. Our number one uh, objective is the reduction of the supply of cocaine and heroin. It's destroying the region and the American people. So that's where our focus is. And the paramilitary, as well as the FARC, are heavily involved with that activity. ELN, somewhat less so. ELN makes most of their money kidnapping people, uh, chopping their ears off, selling them back this aircraft they've got. They're selling the people back one at a time. Uh, but a bunch of the ELN are, of course, also involved in drugs. That's the problem. The money that comes out of the cocaine and heroin producing regions of Colombia. Now, our principal responsibility ought to be reduce the consumption of drugs. That's actually the central piece of this national drug control strategy. That's why we sent a $19.2 billion FY2001 budget over here. For the first time in our country's history, Donna Shalala's got $3.8 billion in drug treatment money in there. So we're putting our mouth uh, and our money behind that strategy. Uh, but this piece of it, we argue, has to also be done. We've got to stand with Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. Thank you. Mr. Thank Barr. You. Mr. Chairman, uh, certainly it, it c comes as no surprise to any of us in this room that uh, you know, we're faced with the situation we face today with uh, Colombia being the, uh, by far, uh, the largest uh, coca cultivation country in the world uh, and on the brink of uh, political and financial disaster. Uh, you know, it's been happening over the last several years. Given the, uh, the power of the groups uh, that the Colombians uh, are fighting, the FARC and the ELN, and perhaps other groups as well, uh, and given the history of how to deal with armed groups uh, that both our nation uh, has, as well as other nations, both in that region and in other parts of the world, uh, in particular, I have in mind uh, recent U.S. military operations against Mr. Milosevic. Uh, we didn't negotiate with him, uh, and uh, not surprisingly, we, we beat him. Uh, President Fujimori in Peru doesn't negotiate uh, with the, the guerrillas uh, and the drug traffickers in his country, and not surprisingly, he beats them. Uh, the government of Bolivia uh, does not negotiate with drug traffickers and guerrillas in his country, and not surprisingly, he beats them. Also, unfortunately, not surprisingly, in Colombia, uh, efforts to negotiate and appease uh, the, uh, the guerrillas and the narco-traffickers have not been successful. Uh, are there not some lessons here, General McCaffrey? Is there any reason for anybody to be optimistic that attempting to negotiate with these people or to appease them or to simply make a show of force uh, will bring them to the negotiating table uh, in any meaningful way? Well, uh, Mr. Congressman, I am unalterably in favor in every case of trying to talk, not fight. Um, in every instance, if there's some way you can get out of using military power or police power, you ought to do it. Now, I think your, your point, though, has an underlying uh, assumption that can you just talk or do we need to strengthen the capabilities of the state to, to uh, in the police and the armed forces the judicial system so that prosecutors can act so that there is a prison system that works. If those pieces of it aren't there, clearly there can't be successful negotiations. But I would also, uh, if I may, uh, suggest 
that uh, these decisions fundamentally will have to be made by the Colombians, and we can uh, wish them well, perhaps advise them, but this sh these, these should not be U.S. Uh, a U.S. calculus on how to balance the economy, the peace process, and the why, why do we take such a hands-off approach vis-a-vis approach vis Colombia uh, when we don't in other parts of the world? I mean, this administration has been very eager uh, to jump the gun and dictate policy in other parts of the world, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but why is it that they are so hesitant and saying, oh, we can't do anything here uh, when we have in other parts of the world and when the type of action that I think you know and I know and others know actually works against these guerrillas, and that is very clear, strong, consistent, aggressive military might against them, works. Why don't we tell that? What, I don't understand why we can't tie our assistance uh, to uh, uh, certain types of policies that we know work, that, uh, that uh, demonstrably has worked in neighboring countries. Why, why such a hands-off approach in Colombia in our own backyard when we're more than willing to just jump in with all sorts of military might and dictate policy in other parts of the world? Well, I, I think uh, we are very heavily involved. I think this plan we sent over, $1.6 billion, is fundamentally uh, dependent upon some uh, very strong action by the Colombians, the Peruvians, the Bolivians. Uh, we are not hands-off. We've got enormous U.S. embassies and a very strong, robust team in, in all three of these Andean Ridge nations. Um, I think uh, we think they're headed in the right direction, uh, but they lack adequate uh, energy and resources for the police and the armed forces, alternative economic well, Energy is a matter of will. Yeah, well, I, I really, to, to be blunt, Mr. Congressman, I think their political will, their courage is not lacking. I think, well, it uh, certainly isn't on the part of General Serrano. Uh, yeah, well, remember, we're, there's 240,000 you know, 240, troops down there, police and armed forces. There's a lot more than General Serrano. We, we wouldn't want to focus on a person. This is a 36 million uh, person nation under internal attack fueled by drug money. But I, I'm not really disagreeing with your point. I'm just saying the negotiations is always better than fighting if you can make it work. And in this case, I don't see any... A uh, way that the U.S. can substitute our own calculus for Colombian thinking. Well, but it's not just our calculus. It's the calculus that has worked demonstrably very well in uh, in Peru and Bolivia. Um, and why can't we uh, say, look, uh, if we are going to make this aid available to you, and hopefully the State Department will finally get the message that the law of this land is the law of this land, and do what they've been told to do. Presuming that happens, and I know that's a big presumption. Presuming that happens. Uh, if we send this assistance down there, and yet the Colombian government uh, continues to try and appease uh, the FARC uh, and to negotiate with them uh, while losing territory and can, while continuing to lose men, aren't we defeating ourselves and almost, uh, uh, almost guaranteeing the failure of our effort? Why don't we tie that assistance to some very tough uh, negotiations uh, and uh, uh, mandates to the, uh, to the Colombians if we're going to be partners in this effort? Well, with the exception of the despeje, which is part of the negotiation process, there's been no time out given by the Colombian government to these criminal organizations. But they uh, have the extended counter, the, the, the counter-narcotics battalion was trained and did deploy and is now conducting combat operations against FARC uh, fronts in the coca growing regions today as we sit here. Those helicopters are headed down to Larandia. There's uh, armored cab units uh, being moved into place. So there's no question uh, w their strategy is to try and regain government control in the South, reinsert the police, use alternative economic development, and eliminate coca and opium production. And I, th I be blunt, I think it'll work. If we stay at them, uh, stay with them over time. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last for just a couple of minutes, Mr. Uh, Mark Green, Congressman Green from Wisconsin, has requested a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for extending the courtesy of allowing me to uh, appear briefly. General McCaffrey, I represent northeastern Wisconsin. Uh, within northeastern Wisconsin is the Menominee Nation and uh, Menominee County. And one of my constituents, Washino Watak, was tragically killed in Columbia. And uh, late last year, the House representatives passed a resolution demanding extradition of those responsible and, of course, we all heard, heard just recently the President of Colombia essentially denying extradition, denying, uh, uh, granting us extradition. 
what is it that I can say to my constituents back in northeastern Wisconsin that will give them some reason for hope in, in this matter? Well, I, I think the uh, brutal murder of those uh, three people was a tragedy, and from the both the classified and the public source reporting on it, it showed the uh, the essential savage nature of the, of the FARC units that were involved. These people were posing no threat to them. They were innocent lives that were tragically and brutally thrown away. Uh, I will uh, be in Columbia next Tuesday. I'll certainly learn more about it and be glad to communicate it back to you. I think uh, the, the public statement of President Pastrana was that they should be prosecuted under Colombian criminal law. Well, if I can just, just follow up and following up on what my colleague Congressman Barr has been saying about putting some conditions uh, expressing the sense of U.S. policy with the money that we send down there, uh, you know, certainly I think it would be appropriate to do so with respect to extradition treaties and how those are implemented. Uh, uh, again, this House passed overwhelmingly, I think, with perhaps one or two negative votes, uh, a demand for extradition. So uh, I would certainly suggest to you that that, that should be a very high priority. And as uh, this House considers the, the package that's been put together, I certainly hope to make uh, uh, that an important issue in the debate. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I think the extradition, uh, to be honest, I've been astonished at the political courage of the Colombians, political and physical courage. Uh, they have revised the law. They're, uh, President Pastrana from the start said he would stand behind extradition. We have ex extradited the first Colombian citizen for a drug-related crime. We are going after all the 30 Millennium Operation suspects, um, and, and, I, and they're paying a the price for it already. These, this has already resulted in three major bomb blasts, so this is not a theoretical proposition. At the same time, I would urge us, though, when it comes to extradition, that we let the Attorney Generals and, th and this go on as a legal process and not as a political one. We've got to preserve the rule of law dealing with evidence and extradition. Well, I, I guess I would just add to that. Um, I understand what you're saying. On the other hand, these were U.S. citizens who were killed uh, down there. And as we look to uh, and, and we're forced to rely upon the government of Colombia in implementing this uh, aggressive plan, sure. certainly that's part of it. Our ability to rely upon them uh, must be justified by action. So again, I understand what you're saying, but inevitably this becomes part of the political arena. And I appreciate mm -hmm. your comments and your attention. Well, I thank, uh, sure. thank you for coming. And uh, I, I also uh, want to thank uh, General McCaffrey for coming and uh, for being uh, such a uh, patient wit witness today here, uh, the viewpoints of members of Congress. And, uh, General, this is only a sampling of those who wanted to uh, attend today and participate. I'm sure that there will be even more uh, hearings and discussion in the next uh, few weeks. Hopefully we can move this package together uh, uh, rapidly. Um, I think everyone wants to see something done. I think that uh, the results of this package may determine how many more kids die on our streets. And it's, a, it's of great uh, importance and concern to all the members of Congress. So we thank you for your efforts to help put this together. Look forward to working with you. and. Uh, there being no further uh, questions at this time, although we will leave the uh, record open. We'll submit those uh, and leave the record open for two weeks. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'd like to call our second panel uh, this afternoon. Second panel consists of four witnesses. Uh, first is uh, General Charles uh, Wilhelm, commander of the U.S. Uh, Southern Command. Uh, the second is Mr. William Ledwith, and he is the Director of International Operations of the Drug Enforcement Administration. The third witness is Ms. Anna Marie Salazar. She is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Drug Policy and Support. And the fourth uh, witness is uh, Ambassador Peter Romero. He's the Assistant Secretary for Latin America uh, with the Department of State. As you do may know, uh, this uh, panel is an investigations and oversight uh, uh, panel of um, House of Representatives. We do swear in our witnesses. Also, if you have lengthy uh, statements uh, uh, or additional material you'd like submitted, uh, either, 
other than uh, what you're presenting uh, verbally, we'll be glad to do that. Uh, and we would like to try to get some limit on uh, time, but uh, we'll, we'll try not to be too strict given the importance of this. If we could have all of our witnesses stand, please, and be sworn. Ms. Salazar, I need your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Witnesses answered in the affirmative, and I'd like to welcome <coughs> back uh, all of uh, these witnesses. And first, we're going to hear from General Charles uh, Wilhelm, commander of the U.S. Southern Command. Uh, pleased to have you here, and uh, also to hear your uh, testimony at this time. You're recognized, sir. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I welcome this opportunity to appear before you to discuss the crisis in Colombia and the things we're doing to help Colombia and its neighbors confront and defeat the threats posed by narcotics traffickers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, uh, Congressman Barr, uh, I had a uh, prepared uh, opening statement. It was a bit lengthy, and I think most of that ground has already been covered Without during... Without objection, then we'll make that part of the record. Thank yeah. you. You're recognized. Thank you, sir. My distinguished colleagues on this panel are well qualified to address a broad range of policy and programmatic issues related to the crisis in the Andean region. I will focus my opening comments at the operational level, concentrating on the counter-drug assistance that Southern Command provided to Colombia's security forces during the past year and the future initiatives that we contemplate if supplemental funding is approved. Mr. Chairman, uh, during the first week of December, I had the opportunity to go to the Pentagon and to brief Secretary Cohen and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on what I termed the way ahead in Colombia. In structuring that briefing, uh, I broke it down into three component parts. The first part uh, I described as Action Plan 99, the second part Action Plan 2000, and the third part, Action Plan 2001 and beyond. Uh, I think uh, for the purposes of our hearing this morning, if I briefly describe uh, what we have accomplished and what we hope to accomplish with our colleagues in Colombia during this three-phase plan, it will provide an adequate foundation uh, for the discussion to follow. Uh, first of all, Action Plan 99. Uh, these are initiatives that uh, are complete. During 1999, we trained 931 members of the Colombian Army and effectively stood up the first uh, Colombian counter-drug battalion. Uh, that battalion attained its initial operational capability on the 15th of December of last year. In tandem with that initi initiative, we created a Colombian Joint Intelligence Center which was co-located uh, with the counter-drug battalion at the base at Tres Esquinas. Uh, this Colombian Joint Intelligence Center uh, contains members of both the armed forces and the Colombian National Police, and we have three U.S. representatives there who will continue to provide uh, instruction and technical advice and assistance as the Joint Intelligence Center uh, carries out its mission of providing fused intelligence and target folders uh, to the Colombian, the first of the Colombian counter-drug battalions, and later uh, the two re remaining battalions and the brigade headquarters, which will constitute the Colombian counter-drug uh, brigade. Also during the past year, we joined forces with our colleagues at INL at State Department, most notably Mr. Randy Beers, and we put the first elements of an aviation battalion in place. Today, there are 18 UH-1N helicopters in Colombia, which will provide tactical mobility initially for the first counter-drug battalion, and subsequently, after being augmented by up to 15 more UH-1Ns uh, for the entire counter-drug brigade. So that takes me to Action Plan 2000. Now I should footnote my comments about Action Plan 1999 by stating that uh, the funding for this was really carved out of existing programs at Southern Command, at State Department, 
and at DEPNS, which Mrs. Salazar uh, represents today. It was a process, really, of reprioritization of other initiatives. Uh, but the funds were identified, were made available. All those organizations have been created, and in fact, they're operating today. Uh, Action Plan 2000 is dependent on the passage of a, of sub, of a uh, supplemental funding package. The key aspects of Plan 2000 include the creation of the 2nd and 3rd Battalions, which will round out the Counter Drug Brigade. We will also train a brigade headquarters and uh, we'll provide a significant uh, range of support uh, to the Colombian Armed Forces and other elements of the security forces in Colombia to carry out interdiction activities which are essential for the achievement of our campaign objectives. The year 2001 and beyond uh, is less certain at this time. We have contracted uh, MPRI, Military Professional Research Institute, to conduct an analysis and study of Colombia's armed forces and uh, to develop an operational concept, to propose uh, candidate force structures and doctrines for Colombia's security forces beyond the CD Brigade. That would take us into the out years. All of these measures support a campaign plan that we have developed uh, to better integrate our counter-drug efforts, not just in Colombia, but throughout the Andean Ridge, and for that matter, on up through Central America and through the nations of the Caribbean that are in the region that we refer to collectively as the transit zone. Uh, this plan uh, is, has been developed in three phases. Uh, phase one, we term regionalization and stabilization. Uh, this is a two-year program which is designed to give the nations in the region the capabilities that they need uh, to successfully oppose the drug threat. Phase two, we term decisive operations. During phase two, which would also be in, of about two years in duration, we would anticipate that the nations of the region uh, would begin to deliver blows to the drug trafficking apparatus that would render it ineffective. Then from year five on, we would enter a sustainment phase during which the nations of the region would adapt to the changing patterns of narcotics trafficking, uh, which we've seen before, and would essentially become self-sufficient uh, in confronting these threats. Uh, so in terms of a long-range strategy and something that uh, really almost always occurs in these dialogues, that in essence is our exit strategy uh, from this struggle. I would like to conclude my opening remarks by identifying one area that I think merits uh, additional consideration on our parts. Uh, I am very much in favor of a Colombia-centric plan to confront this challenge, but not a Colombia-exclusive plan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and uh, Congressman Barr and other members of the panel have already mentioned that there are other stakeholders in this, uh, the surrounding nations. The supplemental, as it's currently framed, uh, does contain support for Bolivia and Peru, though quite candidly, I think not in the amounts that are necessary for them to sustain the success that they've achieved. There has uh, also been uh, suggestions that funding be provided for Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil, and Panama. Uh, I subscribe fully to that because uh, in every sense, uh, this cannot be described as a unilateral or a bilateral undertaking. Uh, I think in, uh, by every definition, it's a regional problem that commands a regional solution. And as we look at the effects of drugs, uh, I think uh, there can be a reasonable suggestion that this is also a hemispheric and a global problem as we look at uh, the transit routes being taken uh, by drugs as they head to Europe and uh, other parts of the world. Uh, sir, I look forward to your questions during the Q&A period that Thank follows. Thank you, and we'll suspend questions until we've heard from all of our panelists. The next uh, witness is Mr. William Ledwith, and he is the Director of Internal International Operations with uh, DEA. Thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon. 
Chairman Miker and members of the subcommittee, it is a pleasure for me to appear here today to testify in the narcotics crisis in Colombia. We in DEA believe that the international trafficking organizations based in Colombia who smuggle their illegal drugs into our country pose a formidable challenge to the national security of the United States. DEA is proud to play a key role in the U.S. government's long-range strategy to assist Colombia in their counter-drug effort. There's a wide range of witnesses here today who can, taken together, give you a broad picture of the current situation in Colombia. I am here to comment on the law enforcement aspects of dealing with the international drug trafficking organizations operating in Colombia today. DEA's mission in Colombia, as in other foreign postings, is to target the most powerful international drug syndicates that operate around the world, supplying drugs to American communities and employing thousands of individuals to transport and distribute their drugs. The international drug syndicates, headquartered in Colombia and operating through Mexico and the Caribbean, control both the sources and the flow of drugs into the United States. Virtually all of the heroin produced in Colombia is destined for the United States market. In fact, Colombia has over the past five years become the leading source of heroin in the United States. Recent DEA statistical data indicates as much as 75 percent of the heroin seized and analyzed by federal authorities in the United States is of Colombian origin. Over half of the cocaine entering the United States continues to come from Colombia through Mexico and across U.S. border points of entry. Colombian drug trafficking groups are no longer the monolithic organizations they were over most of the past two decades. Experienced traffickers who have been active for years but who had worked in the shadow of the Cali drug lords have proven adept at seizing opportunities to increase their role in the drug trade. In addition to trafficking their own cocaine, the organizations operating out of Colombia supply almost all of the cocaine to the Mexican crime syndicates. The Mexican organizations purchase cocaine as well as accepting cocaine in payment from, for services from Colombian trafficking groups. This change in the manner in which business is conducted is also driven by the new trafficking groups arising in Colombia who have chosen to return to the Caribbean in order to move their cocaine to the United States. The Colombians have franchised to criminals from other countries a portion of the mid-level wholesale cocaine and heroin trade on the east coast of the United States. The Colombian groups remain, however, in control of the sources of supply. These subordinates operating in the United States and not the Colombians are now the ones subject to arrest, while the top-level Colombians control the organization with increasingly encrypted telephone calls. <coughs> Colombia has always been the world's number one producer of finished cocaine hydrochloride. Colombia now also has the dubious honor of also being the world's largest producer of cocaine base. Over the past several years, Colombian cocaine cultivation and cocaine production have been increasing dramatically. <coughs> Colombian traffickers continue to become more self-sufficient by increasing cocaine base production within Colombia itself to offset the decline in base previously brought in from Peru and Bolivia. There continues to be deep concern in DEA, as in the rest of the administration and in the Congress, about the connection between the FARC and other groups in Colombia and the drug trade. The presence of the insurgents in Colombia's eastern lowlands and southern rainforest, the country's primary coca cultivation and cocaine processing regions, hinders the Colombian government's ability to conduct counter-drug operations. The frequent ground fires sustained by Colombian National Police eradication aircraft operating in insurgent-occupied areas shows the extent to which some insurgent units will go to protect the economic interests of their local constituency. Some insurgent units raise funds through extortion or by protecting laboratory operation. In return for cash payments, or possibly in exchange for weapons, the insurgents protect cocaine laboratories in southern Colombia. The most recent DEA reporting indicates that some FARC units in southern Colombia are indeed directly involved in drug trafficking activities, such as controlling local cocaine base markets. Some insurgent units have assisted drug trafficking groups in transporting and storing cocaine and marijuana within Colombia. In particular, some insurgent units protect clandestine airstrips in southern Colombia. The Colombian National Police continue to pursue significant drug investigations in cooperation with the DEA. 
On October 13, 1999, the Colombian National Police, the Colombian Prosecutor General's Office, DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the Department of Justice Criminal Division carried out Operation Millennium, a long-term complex investigation targeting the inner workings of several of the most important international drug trafficking opera organizations operating in Colombia and Mexico. This operation resulted in the indictment and, and arrest of one of the former leaders of the Medellin drug cartel, along, along with the indictment of 30 other significant defendants from Colombia. The United States has requested extradition of these 31 defendants. If that extradition is completed, this operation will be one of the most <coughs> successful and significant <coughs> drug enforcement events since the elimination of the Medellin cartel. DEA will continue to direct assets and resources at the command and control structures of the major drug trafficking organizations operating throughout Colombia. All DEA programs, in one form or another, will focus on the identification and immobilization of major drug trafficking organizations. To further augment these objectives, programs such as the Andean Initiative, Sensitive Investigative Units, and the Intelligence Collection Programs will be the primary support for DEA's enforcement efforts. These units will be encouraged to work simultaneously with DEA domestic offices in the United States in coordinated transnational investigations targeting all aspects of these organizations so as to maximize both the effect and the return on our investment. To conclude, we can and should continue to identify and build cases against the leaders of the new criminal groups from Colombia. A growing number of initiatives hold particular promise for success. The special program of vetted units funded by the Congress under the Vetted Unit Initiative will make it pro possible to continue to conduct high-level drug investigations in Colombia and the region without fear of compromise. This is by far our most important investigative tool. We intend to carry out even more of the cutting-edge, sophisticated investigations like Millennium as part of a joint DOJ, Criminal Division, DEA, and Colombian National Police bilateral case initiative. Such operations benefit from the closest possible cooperation between the DEA and the Colombian National Police. These operations will effectively demonstrate that even the highest level traffickers based in foreign countries cannot manage drug operations inside the United States with impunity. DEA supports Plan Colombia. DEA will continue to work closely with specially trained and vetted <coughs> Colombian law enforcement units, other Colombian law enforcement agencies, and Colombian prosecutors to initiate joint investigations. Colombia faces dramatic challenges to the rule of law, many of which are directly related to drug trafficking. Plan Colombia addresses many of these elements. The support to multilateral investigations, counter drug units, and multi and money laundering sections of the Justice Initiative portion of Plan Colombia can support DEA, Colombian National Police, DAS, and Colombian prosecutors' efforts to fight drug trafficking in Colombia. Other sections of the Justice Initiative of Plan Colombia can provide more indirect support to DEA, Colombian National Police, DAS, and Colombian prosecutors' efforts to investigate major Colombian drug trafficking organizations. These sections include support to money laundering, asset forfeiture, training for police prosecutors and judges, security for victims and witnesses, prison assistance, and procedural and legislative reforms to the Colombian legal system. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. I will be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Again, we'll suspend questions and now hear from Anna Marie Salazar, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Drug Policy and Support. You're recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify once again before this committee. And I would like to uh, convey to you that the Secretary, Secretary Cohen is, is not only aware of some of the concerns that have been expressed in this committee, but he has also been in close, uh, has been in conversations with the Colombia, Colombian government. He has met with President Pastrana and he's met various times with the Minister of Defense. I want to say that the department is committed to its congressionally mandated counter drug mission and the department has been perform performing this mission with distinction for more than a decade. I would like to make my remarks short, uh, and if you allow me, I would like to introduce, uh, submit for the record, a, a written... Without objection, that material may made part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe it would be helpful for me to start out by enumerating the principles that guide our support to, uh, to that country, to Colombia. Our legal authorities limit our assistance to the following areas. 
provision of non-lethal equipment, counter-drug training, counter-drug information sharing, and minor engineering projects. Secondly, U.S. military forces have not and will not participate directly in counter-narcotics operations in the field. Thirdly, U.S. forces have not and will not become involved in the Colombian government's counterinsurgency conflict. Furthermore, the government of Colombia has not solicited our assistance in their counterinsurgency counter efforts. Lastly, we monitor the activity of our DOD uh, Department of Defense presence in Colombia very carefully. We are confident that we can continue to provide counter-narcotics assistance as we have been doing for the past 10 years without being drawn into this conflict. Now, um, in response to the, to, to the Plan Colombia, um, I, uh, the programs that the Department of Defense will be responsible for executing were developed by uh, the SINC and his team and our interagency partners, including uh, DEA, um, the intelligence community, and more importantly, uh, these were this this packet, or at least Department of Defense packet, part of the supplemental, was in response to what the Colombians asked us for. The Department of Defense programs in the supplemental, I must say, are not new. They are enhancements to ongoing programs in Colombia and respond to our mandated counter drug responsibilities in the region. Now, uh, General Wilhelm did I uh, gave you a summary of the different programs that the Department of Defense is not only sponsoring uh, uh, or uh, supporting this moment in Colombia, but would hope to support if he, if we uh, if the supplemental was uh, if you pass the supplemental. I would just like to in, so instead of me going through what these programs are, I'd just like to add two more comments that uh, uh, to some of the descriptions of the programs provided by General Wilhelm. I would just like to emphasize that. As we undertake the training of these battalions, um, we do not, uh, we will not have a substantial increase in our footprint, that is, our military presence in Colombia. Another comment I would like to make, that we plan to enhance existing intelligence collection efforts, in part and based to some of the requests we've received uh, from General uh, Wilhelm, but also based on the requests we've received from the Colombians. We believe that this is an essential element for ensuring the success of these programs. We feel that the supplemental is a balance and an executable plan. However, we do know that there are challenges, and I'd like to enumerate some of these challenges that we foresee. Military reform. First, the Colombian military is not optimally structured to conduct sustained counter-drug operations, and I believe General Wilhelm mentioned some of the issues that he has encountered in some of the programs that we plan to do and what we plan to do in order to support them. Second, human rights. Uh, we have expressed to the Colombian government the importance of human rights. The practices and procedures the U.S. has put in place, such as vetting every single person that receives training from the U.S. government, is one example. Another example is U.S. soldiers who train their Colombian counterparts who have served as examples we also believe have made a difference. Also important, I believe, is President Pastrana's reforms that he has invocated, such as the overhaul of the military, military justice system and General Tapia's interest in going after high-level officials within the uh, Colombian Army who he believes, or there is some indications that they have participated in human rights violations. Nonetheless, we must remain vigilant. There is also room for improvement. Lastly, I want to make a comment about the counter-drug versus the counterinsurgency issues. As I alluded to before, the Department of Defense will not step over the line that divides counter-drug from counterinsurgency. We have safeguards in place to ensure that our existing policy remains inviolate. These safeguards include extensive reviews of where U.S. forces will be deployed for training, as well as end-use monitoring regime, which includes looking after as to how the assets we provide Colombia will be used. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the Department of Defense fully supports the supplemental request to support Plan Colombia. Uh, we believe this package represents a sound, responsive, and timely assistance. President Pastrana asked for our help to control the flow of illegal drugs coming into the United States. It is time to move forward, and I hope that with your support, we can do this soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your comments. Thank you. And our last witness on this panel is Ambassador <coughs> Peter Romero, Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America. You're recognized. Welcome, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, with your indulgence, uh, I had prepared a statement. I'd like to submit Without it for the record. Objection, the entire statement will be made part of the record. 
what I'd like to do uh, with your indulgence is to talk a little bit about, uh, well, three issues that were touched upon but not really delved into in the comments uh, uh, as the panel started and even before with uh, Barry McCaffrey. First of all, uh, let me say that um, just to give you some political context uh, to the politics of negotiations with the FARC and others in, in Colombia, President Pastrana was in a dead heat back in 1998 with his adversary running for the presidency, a guy by the name of Horacio Serpa. And he decided that uh, the country really wanted more than anything else peace. And he leaned into the peace issue, talked about how he'd get it done, made contact with, uh, with, with the guerrilla groups, uh, and won those elections where he was trailing by 6%, came out ahead about 6%, visited the FARC uh, uh, headquarters, uh, did some other dramatic gestures, said that peace was going to be his highest priority. Now, he was inaugurated in August of 1998, and it is uh, uh, February of the year 2000, and there is unmistakable evidence that the FARC didn't uh, necessarily share his optimism about the pace of the peace talks. Quite to the contrary, their strategy from the very beginning was to talk and fight, uh, with the emphasis on the latter as opposed to the former. Uh, and 18 months or so later, uh, we are n just now beginning to see some fruit from all of the hopes of the Colombian people. A couple months ago, uh, the Colombians put about 10 million people out of a population of about 36 million in the street in support of peace. There have been a number of other uh, demonstrations. Let me just sum them up by saying that there is overwhelming and widespread support for continued uh, negotiations with all of the irregular forces down there. For our purposes and for the purposes of the Colombian government, that does not mean that they can't talk and fight at the same time. It is obvious that the FARC guerrillas have adapted that strategy, and I think that the, the, the Colombian government very much knows that that's, that's what they need to do. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, push into the south, into the area called the Puto Mayo, if I might beg your indulgence. This is the area right around where my highlighted, where the, where the highlighter is. And this is uh, an area east of the Andes in the plains and jungles. This whole area, encompassing about 60% of the landmass of Colombia, only has about 8% of the population. And most of that 8% is located in this Putumayo area. It's a population of about 263,000 people, uh, mostly rural, uh, 31,000 uh, or 65,000 directly get their income from coca growing, uh, and 60% of the economy down there is derived from illicit crops such as, such as coca. Uh, it is going to be difficult. Uh, uh, there were mass demonstrations in the summer of 1996 when the government tried to stop the introduction of precursor chemicals uh, into the region. The guerrillas, there is absolutely no doubt that the guerrillas animated the general population to disrupt the police deployments to the area. And so that's the main reason why in our Plan Columbia package the emphasis is on the military. But the emphasis that's on the military does not end there. It incorporates the police. Uh, it incorporates civilian agencies. Plante, the alternative development agency, will, will go in uh, to provide for alternative crops. There will be microcredit. There will be human rights observers down there. They'll hold local elections. Uh, there will be all of the things that are essential to the democratic process at the grassroots. If uh, the $145 million that we've identified in in our support for Clan, Clan Columbia is not enough. Uh, it, it is only because in the initial stages the emphasis has to be on winning this area back under the control of uh, the, uh, the Colombian government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate all of our witnesses' testimony. And let me get right into some questions. Um, uh, Ms. Salazar, uh, one of my concerns is it doesn't appear that uh, supporting this uh, anti-narcotics efforts has been either a priority of the administration or DOD. Um, can you put this, let me have this chart here. In fact, let's just put it up in front of Sharon. 
I requested a G GAO independent study of what's taking place and got these results back just a month ago, as you know, and we held a hearing on this. But this shows uh, Southcom requesting, these are the requests uh, here in the tall order. The red is actually what was delivered. We see actually a decrease uh, in, in what's uh, being uh, provided uh, to Southcom in this effort. What's happening? During my, uh, and I appreciated the uh, opportunity I had to testify about this approximately two weeks ago, and what, um, and th there's a number of issues here. We are very conscious, uh, the Department of Defense is very, very conscious of the SYNC's request for more intelligence uh, asset support and also uh, detection and monitoring support. And as we had stated before, uh, a number of these assets are used not only in counter drug missions for the Americas, but are used in other missions around the world. Um, so they're uh, being diverted to other nations around the world. Um, and, and, and as we had explained uh, in, in prior instance, we're talking about missions to Kosovo or Iraq or mm -hmm. Um, now, well, let, with that, with that said, sir, I mean, I mean, there has been a number of us within the department that, and I'm, one of, I'm probably one of the loudest voices that we have uh, fought quite vehemently and, and, and underlined the need to provide the sink this type of support. But when you have uh, these other types of missions, which are the main priority for the Department of Defense coming on board, it's it's difficult, and I. I find myself putting myself in the secretary's shoes and having to make the decisions and, and, and generals and the joint staff and having how they have to make these decisions with relatively very few assets and trying to allocate those assets in the best way possible. Well, you know, as a member of Congress, I, I'm concerned. I, I, I cited 15,900 and I think it was 73 Americans lost their lives and the most recent statistics I have. Uh, due to drug-related causes. The general corrected all of us and said 52,000. Was I, Did I hear him correct? That's I think right. you heard that. How many Americans died in Kosovo, Ms. Salazar? Um, I, I couldn't give you the numbers, no. Were there any civilian casualties uh, even before we went in? But, the, you know, this, it, it, the situation just got out of hand, and, and we have tried uh, repeatedly. I've been on this panel and in this committee since 1993, uh, and you could almost predict what was going to happen. To the package, Mr. Um, led with, um, are there any le vetted uh, units uh, that you spoke about the need for in this package? Are there vetted units asked for in that package, sir? Yes. No, sir, there are not. And you think that's a key element that we need, uh, at, at least from the enforcement side? Our experience with vetted units, sir, is they've allowed us to work investigations at the very, very highest level without fear of compromise. Operation Millennium comes to mind. We would not have been able to conduct that operation without the tremendous input of the Department of Justice, Columbia National Police, DEA, and, of course, the vetted units. Uh, General Wilhelm, in the report that I requested, uh, and you briefed me during the holidays. Uh, uh, you said we can only detect 15 percent of the activity, 15 percent of the time. Uh, your quote, uh, and uh, with the with uh, our loss of the base in Panama today, today, what is our capability uh, to detect uh, uh, drugs coming into the country? Mr. Chairman, that was a correct uh, recital of what I told you during our meeting in Miami over the holidays. Uh, on any given day, we can cover about 15 percent of the area, 15 percent of the time. Uh, you may recall that I mentioned that uh, to a very large extent, that's more a statement about the size of the area than it is the sufficiency of resources. But given the loss of uh, Panama as right. a base and operating, our forward operating location, what is our capability now, say, compared to a year ago? It's much reduced, sir. Uh, we closed the runway at Howard on the 1st of May of last year. Prior to that time, during any given year, we operated 21 different kinds of aircraft uh, in the counter-drug uh, struggle and conducted about 2,000 missions per year. 
Uh, to replace Howard, as you know, sir, we have uh, developed the concept of the forward operating locations that General McCaffrey uh, spoke about. Right now, uh, we have the capacity at the FOLs at uh, Curaçao, Aruba, and Manta, Ecuador, to run about a third of the missions that we ran out of Howard. The key point there is the need for expedited funding so that we can develop the capacities and the capabilities of those FOLs and we can restore the capabilities that we had uh, prior to the Howard closing. As I know you're aware, Mr. Chairman, there's 38.6 million in the supplemental during fiscal year 00 to do the horizontal construction at Manta, Ecuador, and I really need to underscore the importance of Manta. Manta, we did sign the long-term 10-year agreement, which was of concern to the Congress. Uh, that took place on the 18th of uh, January. Uh, Manta is the one site that provides coverage of Peru, all of Colombia, and most of Bolivia. So when we're talking about the deep source zone, where the majority of cultivation takes place, where we have the majority of the laboratories, that is precisely the region we can access from Manta. That part of the supplemental is crucial to us. And Manta is the... Uh base in Ecuador that needs the uh, most work, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Uh, can you point that out on the map? Yeah. <laughs> Taking a page out of your book. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've seen in the last few weeks the FARC now going to Europe uh, and looking to negotiate now, I cannot believe that the only reason they're going there is uh, for uh, peace purposes on their own, but I think that even the sheer threat of uh, this enormous uh, aid package has them uh, inclined to uh, negotiate uh, before some of this arrives. Is that correct, Mr. Ambassador? Mr. Chairman, um if you, if you peel away FARC rhetoric about our package, uh, which basically says things like uh, this will only militarize the situation, prolong the war, et cetera, et cetera, and you look at what's happened over the last couple of weeks, you get a very clear sense that the aid package is having the desired effect. I went down to Columbia with the secretary a couple of weeks ago, and it was no mistake that when she went down there a few days after the aid package, our, our intention to go to, uh, to you all for such a package was announced here in Washington. Uh, the uh, supreme uh, leader of the FARC came out with a statement basically saying uh, that there's just a few little minor details, but uh, they're ready to crank up the negotiations seriously. Uh, I think uh, that there is a causal effect. Uh, they, they did go to Sweden and Norway, and I'm told uh, uh, that they had uh, a meeting at, uh, at the Vatican today. Uh, and I think all of that is a direct result of the fact that they see the writing on the wall. With the Plus, package. we have one unit which uh, the situation has been a disaster as far as uh, military uh, incursions and, uh, and operations against the FARC until uh, just a few weeks ago when our one train battalion uh, finally was deployed. And I understand that was successful. So I think they see the handwriting on the wall finally. Ms. Salazar, I would like on my desk by the close of business next week the location of every Black Hawk helicopter that the DOD has and that we have in our reserve force, because we're going to figure out some way to get some assets down there sooner rather than later. With that, I'll yield to the ranking member. Uh, thank Mink. you very much. Uh, Mr. Ledwith, uh, did I hear you correctly when in response to the chairman's question about vetted units, that there was no uh, addition in this plan to augment these programs that have been so successful? There is no specific line item that I am aware of at this time. We have had significant resources over the last few years, both by the administration and by Congress, to allow us to establish the vetted unit program. We've been able to expand it to many countries utilizing the congressional funding. And my understanding is there was not any specific language as to more vetted units in this bill. Well, in your opinion, would that be one way of uh, strengthening 
the Colombian <clears throat> law enforcement agencies in uh, doing a more comprehensive job in uh, reaching out and getting all of these drug traffickers? We have found the, the vetted unit program throughout the region. I speak regionally because it's a regional issue. We have found the vetted unit program to allow us to target the highest levels of organizational structures and to work with the, uh, uh, with, without fear of compromise. So yes, the vetted unit program is a tremendous investigative tool and it must be taken regionally, of course, because the, the, op the operations in Colombia impact on the adjoining well, How countries. successful have they been up to now in Colombia? Our vetted unit program has resulted in the, the most major investigative successes enjoyed with the Columbia National Police. So why would not a program like this be increased um, given additional resources if they have been successful, if indeed one of the five points in the Plan Columbia is a uh, drug strategy, counter drug strategy? I, I can't answer that directly. I would say that we have had a significant infusion of resources over the last few years that have enabled us to project vetted units, at least a vetted unit in each of the countries in that region. But the whole justification for the Colombian plan is that notwithstanding what we have done up to now, that there are <clears throat> these increased uh, productions and increased uh, trafficking from Colombia into the United States. So clearly something more than what currently is in in uh, fact, in place uh, needs to be done in order for us to make a significant impact on this increased trafficking. I think anything that can be done to assist the Colombians in this effort is worthwhile, ma'am. Uh, in your testimony, uh, Mr. Uh, Ledwith, on page 7, you talk about <clears throat> uh, the uh, FARC units in southern Colombia, and you note there remains, however, no information that any FARC or ELN units have established international transportation, wholesale distribution, or drug money laundering networks in the United States. Would you expand on that sentence? As of this date, ma'am, and, and it's a very dynamic situation, and we are watching it very closely. As of this date, we have no definitive evidence that they, the FARC has expanded their activities outside of Colombia, is what I am saying that comment. They are very much involved in, in drug trafficking at a variety of levels within Colombia, but at this point we do not have definitive proof that they have taken those activities outside of Colombia. And then you go on in that same paragraph to say northern and central Colombia continues to be the primary base of operations for paramilitary groups. Recent reporting indicates that paramilitary groups have become more active in southern Colombia. You want to expand on that we are also greatly concerned about the activities of the paramilitary organization uh, there the human rights violations and a variety of concern so we, we watch the, them very closely I, I meant to imply that we are not solely focused on the FARC and uh, then you go on to explain that they're not significantly involved uh, in uh, poppy cultivation and marijuana. But then in the last paragraph, you say several paramilitary groups also raise funds through extortion or by protecting laboratory operations in northern and central Colombia. The Carlos Castano organization and possibly other paramilitary groups appear to be directly involved in processing cocaine. Can you comment on that further? Yes. We, I would be saying that there is not a definitive institutional involvement, but there are limited circumstances in which there is a more direct managerial role, and that, that, that particular incident is one I would be referring to. Which paramilitary groups are involved in drug trade? I would be happy to respond to you, ma'am, in, in a more private opportunity, if we may, with that information. Uh, may, may the, ask, the, the reason for ask. my inquiry there is that we did submit uh, five questions to the DA for response after the August hearing, and we have not yet received your reply. So I was going to interject those same questions into the record. So if I might get an understanding that those questions which were submitted to you in August will in fact be responded to, to me either in the record, for the record, or to my office directly, I would certainly appreciate it. I'm very sorry to hear that you weren't given an appropriate no, we were immediate not given response. I can assure you that you will be. If I may follow up, um, 
can you testify before us that there is any right-wing paramilitary uh, efforts being supported by drug trafficking? We have information that would indicate that certain paramilitary elements are deriving income from extortion of drug trafficking activities. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, are you? I'm sorry. I'm I not through, but I'll go take right my ahead. Time. I'll take my second one. Thank you. Our Vice Chairman, uh, then Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could ask uh, Mr. Macklin to uh, put up uh, two pictures. Uh, if you could put them both up, uh, maybe hold the other one. Uh, we talk about negotiating with terrorists, uh, and it's sort of a theoretical discussion that we've had. Uh, my view is that you negotiate with terrorists and you lose, and I think that's the experience uh, of people that have tried that. Uh, these two, uh, two pictures uh, are Jorge Briseño Suarez, alias Mono Yoyoy, Chief Military Officer of the FARC, and number two is uh, Henry Castellanos, alias Romagna. Eastern Bloc Commandante for FARC. Uh, would any of the four, four of you uh, like to sit down with these gentlemen and think that you would be successful negotiating with them? I didn't think so. With regard to our loss of operational capability out of Howard Air, Bay, Air Force Base and the other facilities that we maintained until recently in Panama, how long has it been that we have known that the capability that previously we maintained at Howard, for example, uh, would be lost in 1999? Was this something that uh, popped up in 1999, or had we known for quite some time that we would lose that capability? Uh, Congressman Barr, I'll take that question. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, decision to uh, close the facilities at Howard came at the end of a, an extended series of negotiations with the Panamanians, uh, which were really oriented toward preserving a post-2000 presence uh, in Panama. Quite frankly, when I assumed command of Southern Command in September of 97, uh, I did so with about a 95 percent expectation that in the year 2000 I'd have somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500 troops on the ground, that that 8,500-foot runway would be open, and that we would be conducting the counter-drug operations, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance support missions that I discussed previously uh, from Howard. As we all know, I was wrong. Uh, the negotiations did not pan out, and uh, we were left uh, very much short-sheeted. Uh, we had a lot to do, not much time to do it in, and, of course, we had international negotiations uh, with where, Ecuador. Where was the, where was the, in what uh, agency of our government was the decision made not to make any contingency plans whatsoever uh, to uh, have that capability sustained somewhere else? Uh, basically, it seems what happened is we had these negotiations, uh, and uh, they didn't go anywhere. And we could argue, I suppose, over why they didn't go anywhere. But apparently, we had no contingency plans whatsoever. Uh, where was the decision in our government made to have no contingency plans? And now we're basically playing, playing catch up, uh, trying to both maintain some sort of capability with regard to uh, monitoring the, the air routes at the same time as we're engaged in unknown negotiations over the very basics of how to to construct and maintain and pay for those facilities. Was this the Department of State that made the decision to not have contingency plans? Was it defense? Was it DEA? Or was it the military? Uh, Congressman Barr, again, if I could, let me just answer for my part of the United States government, United States Southern Command. We did begin to frame contingency plans long before the negotiations were terminated with Panama. And in fact, uh, we did an inspection of the region. We made our, an assessment uh, based on geography, based on range, operational reach. Uh, capabilities of existing airfields and probability of successful negotiations as to where, where we where, could establish then, these falls. If the military did its job, and I and I certainly uh, believe that you know that that's a, that that's accurate. Where was the decision made not to implement any of that? Was that a policy decision that the Secretary of State made, or the Secretary of Defense, or the President? Uh, sir, uh, I'll lead off and then pass uh, perhaps down uh, to Ambassador Romero. 
Uh, from my point of view, sir, uh, we actually started the ball rolling to identify and to, to start uh, getting a dialogues going on a bilateral basis with the Netherlands for Curaçao and Aruba and with uh, Ecuador for Manta before uh, the talks were terminated with Panama. I met personally with uh, President uh, Mawat in Ecuador. I met with President Fujimori in Peru because we had a couple of candidate sites there, uh, and I met with the Governor General uh, in uh, the Netherlands Antilles and with the commander of the Netherlands forces in the Antilles. Uh, I'd have to pass it on to Ambassador Romero to comment on the Washington side of that. Well, first of all, I think uh, if you're talking about uh, Howard Air Force Base, you're talking about a an installation whose geography and, and infrastructure was just about as optimum as it gets in terms of counter-narcotics flights in the region. And I think Charlie will bear me up, uh, will, will support me on that. Uh, I don't think that there was a hiccup between the time that we essentially decided that there was no way, f no way ahead with respect to the Panamanians and the time that we actually launched people into, uh, into the field to start talking to those governments where we thought forward operating locations in the alternative would work. Uh, I think that the negotiation, well, first of all, we got interim agreements uh, almost immediately in the, on those three locales. Uh, we nailed down a, uh, a, a permanent agreement with the Ecuadorians in, I think, record time. And we are scheduled to uh, sign uh, the agreements with uh, uh, the uh, Netherlands Antilles with Curaçao and Aruba uh, within the next two and a half weeks. Uh, we still need another one in Central America because the flow, uh, I'm told, is moving west into the Pacific. And there needs to be better coverage in that area north of Colombia and, and, and up on the western side of, of the isthmus. Uh, it's architecture uh, that uh, that we're putting together, but then there's a lot of shortfalls in terms of installations and, and infrastructure that uh, General Wilhelm was talking about that, that we'll need to put together. There, it's just not automatically down there in the places that we need it. No, I know it's clearly not automatically down there, but it seems to me that there are a few instances in the history of our relations with other countries where we have not not had more forewarning of something that was going to happen. I mean, this treaty was signed in the late 1970s, and uh, knowing these countries, knowing as you all do, I'm sure, uh, having engaged in many, many negotiations with other countries with regard to base rights and landing rights and so forth, you all know that it takes a long time. It just seems to me that looking as the general has said that uh, even even with all of the 1997-98 assets available, Southcom will only be able to cover 15 percent of key trafficking routes 15 percent of the time. I mean, a, a very, very small percentage of coverage. Uh, and yet we're still trying to negotiate. Uh, we don't even have full, uh, it's my understanding, we don't even have uh, all, as the general stated in his testimony, written testimony, we don't even have all-weather 24-hour operations. Uh, those aren't even set to begin for, for several months. Uh, I'm, I'm just mystified as, as to, you know, there seems to be a huge gap here between an anticipated event that we've known for 20 years was going to come, even though there was a possibility at some point in time that we might have been able to negotiate a continued presence in Panama. That was just a contingency. Uh, and here we are. Uh, with virtually no capability at all right now, except for very small coverage. I'm just astounded that we have this huge gap there. Uh, I, we, will we have additional time, Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, yes, I think we're, we're going to go around. Okay, and I'd like the record to reflect when I requested of the four uh, panelists, uh, if any of them would like to sit down and negotiate with, t with these two, uh, two men with any degree of uh, likelihood of success that no, nobody raised their hand. I just say that at this point, one of the problems we have in Manta is I understand the runway is in such bad shape that some of the aircraft, key aircraft, can't use it. In Aruba, we have a limited uh, takeoff uh, capability, particularly now in the tourist season when those planes get priority. Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to apologize to the panel that I was not able to hear your testimony. If my questions have already been answered, just refer me to your testimony and I'll move on. Um, it's my understanding, General, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, over 200 U.S. military personnel 
are in Colombia on any given day right now on intelligence training and, and radar missions. Is that correct? Uh, no, ma'am, not entirely. Uh, this is a fluid number. It depends on what we happen to be doing on a given day. It can go from a low of 80 to a high of about 220. I think a good daily average over the last year as we've been involved in training these new Colombian uh, Army units has been in the range of about 150 to 180. I think that's a good ballpark average. Okay. And I wanted to ask, then, how the U.S. military presence will change as a result of this stepped-up program, if at all? I think it'll change in some subtle ways, and I have recommended that it change in some subtle ways. Uh, we have a pretty ambitious training program for the year 2000, assuming that the supplemental is approved. But uh, honestly, I believe that we can achieve most of what we need to do at the force levels that we've had during the past year. We'll train two battalions with just a minor overlap. Uh, just uh, to make it specific, uh, we conducted this training in, in three phases. Uh, during the first two phases, we used about 57 soldiers each time from the 7th Special Forces Group. The third phase, which involved integration training, was a little bit more complex, and we went up to about 65 uh, with some additional specialists who were conducting intelligence and other training. I suspect we're going to stay in the ballpark during the year 2000. The area that I would like to see some adjustments uh, is in our management capabilities. Uh, if this supplemental is approved. The military group that uh, works for me in Bogota right now and supports Ambassador Cayman and the country team, uh, I believe will be far too thin uh, to really do the management tasks that will confront it. Also, we have a colonel right now, very well qualified, but I believe that uh, our interests would be very well served by putting a general officer on the ground in Colombia. Uh, he'd provide seniority, uh, probably access uh, to some meetings and conferences where uh, I think our participation would be indicated. Uh, and I think we're just going to need more depth to do the job the way it needs to be done. Uh, General McCaffrey, during his testimony, uh, commented about the need to develop an integrated interagency mechanism here in Washington to oversee the same task. Uh, they'll be asking the questions, I need enough people with the right seniority and the right skills to provide the answers from Columbia. Not a big upsurge. Uh, but uh, uh, some increase in numbers and some in increase in seniority. Thank you. I wanted to um, ask a couple of questions about the um, human rights performance of the uh, Pastrana government and of the um, security forces. Um, you know, we could put up a lot of pictures of unsavory people in, uh, in, in Colombia, um, and I'm sure that um, none of them would be um, the, the kind of individuals that we would want to sit, sit down with. Nonetheless, we are engaged in a, in a struggle to find a, uh, at some point, a, a solution, a, a solution that would stabilize the, the government of, uh, of Colombia. And I'm concerned about the um, poor performance, according to the State Department, that the Pastrana government has on, uh, on human rights. I know that we have the Leahy Amendment, which says that the security forces cannot receive U.S. counter-narcotics aid if there's credible evidence of gross human rights violations. But the State Department has found that three of the six Army brigades that operate in the major drug traffic er areas have not taken effective measures to bring soldiers responsible for gross human rights violations to justice. So I'm asking, and I'm not sure whom, maybe you, Ambassador, what you would recommend that the Colombian government do to root out the soldiers that um, are believed to have uh, engaged in these human rights violations. As someone who was pretty low on the totem pole back in the early 80s uh, and uh, involved in Central America, I have to tell you that um, had uh, President Reagan gotten a response from the Salvadoran government uh, that we are getting from the Pastrana government vis-a-vis -vis human rights, President Reagan would have been kicking up his heels. Uh, President Pastrana has uh, cashiered four generals. Uh, he, has, uh, he has removed about two dozen colonels and majors. Uh, some of them are under indictment. Others are still being investigated. 
Uh, we, for our part, uh, are um, uh, implementing what we do, faithful to the Leahy Amendment. Those uh, units that you were talking about, uh, if they don't pass muster, they will not get U.S. assistance, whether it be material or whether it be training. The counter-narcotics uh, units that Charlie is standing up uh, have all of their officers vetted uh, for human rights uh, uh, and to ensure that they haven't engaged in gross violations of human rights. Uh, this, is, this is not something that we only insist upon. This is something that President Pastrana insists upon. Uh, that's not to say that there are no human rights violations, or more accurately, that there aren't connections between some officers and paramilitary groups. There are, okay? But I think that President Pastrana has done uh, a good job and continues to be committed to rooting out those bad officers and getting rid of them. Well, are you satisfied that the, the progress has been made on upgrading the, the penal code? I know that the three, that, well, I, you say four generals, I, I know about three. I've got the I fourth have. one okay, here four. that okay. I can give you. Um, that um, they're not un currently under investigation for their role in human rights abuses and they aren't going to be brought to trial, that there's 500 outstanding arrest warrants in, uh, in issued by the Attorney General's office against uh, paramilitary groups and, you know, have the security forces really act decisively against those uh, to, uh, regarding those outstanding warrants. The, uh, the penal code, I understand that some of the provisions, a provision that crimes against dignity uh, could not be tried in a military court system were, was removed so that jurisdiction over cases of human rights violations will be conducted on the current practice on a case-by-case -case basis. So some of the, the, the most Im important in, in some of our views. Um, provisions were not in the in the penal code. Are they making the progress that is satisfying to you? Well, I don't I don't think any of us are satisfied. Uh, but I have to tell you that uh, that I think if there had been this much progress back in 1980 in El Salvador, that war would have been a whole lot shorter. Because I'm we are firmly convinced that when you have gross violations of human rights, you're only politicizing the countryside and forcing kids to sign up with one side or the other. Uh, and I think that uh, President Pastrana, when you look that he's been in office for 18 months uh, and what he's been able to inculcate within that armed force, uh, it's, it's, pr it's pretty spectacular. Are we satisfied? We're not satisfied. Well, well finally then, let me ask if, if we feel that built into the aid that we're giving, there are enough accountability measures so that at every step of the way that we can go back and assess compliance with uh, standards of human dignity. The Leahy Amendment in, in, in its practice provides that there has to be follow-up and there has to be accountability. And uh, only then will we be able to certify that a unit, uh, even a, a, in this particular case, a unit who has had officers who have committed gross violations, that they have taken the steps necessary to correct it and to punish those responsible. And in this case, if they don't take those measures, uh, then we'll be, uh, we'll be pressing the, the Colombian government and we'll be cutting off aid to that unit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Souter, as soon as you get settled, uh, we're pleased to recognize you. Gentleman Thank you. from Indiana. Um, I have, uh, if I could, uh, and I'm sorry if I got tied up with the arguably one of the most important groups in your district that is broadcasting people <laughs> from the TV and radio, and I wanted to come back over, but if I could follow up um, um, on a couple of the questions that I had raised earlier, uh, maybe start with General Wilhelm, it's good to see you again, as well as Ms. Salazar, uh, who uh, in Santiago went through some of our discussions uh, before as we argued about helicopters and a number of other things. But I wanted to particularly, I, I, I raised the question and I would like to hear a kind of an official response on the, some of the concerns I raised about the military units. Because um, in the uh, Defense Department, as they come up with these new anti-narcotics groups, there is a concern that uh, about the whether they're going to use draftees, whether they're going to be high school graduates, uh, whether the pay, there's going to be pay such that it becomes an elite uh, division. Uh, 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 Defense Secretary Ramirez 
told me that was their goal and they were moving that direction. But as I understand it, that uh, draftees only have to serve one year. And, and we're talking about having to train pilots. We're talking about people who need long-term commitments. What specific guarantees do we have on behalf of the, the taxpayers of the United States that if we try to build a new unit, that this is in fact going to be a fully vetted, well-trained, long-term committed people who will be able to operate the helicopters and the equipment? Uh, Congressman Sutter, I, I'll lead off on that if it's all right, sir. Uh, first of all, there has been really a high degree of selectivity as to who is in these units, starting with individual vetting of the officers in the 1st Counter Drug Battalion. Uh, this battalion was really formed of uh, soldiers who came from two sources. One were professional career soldiers who volunteered to become a, me a part or members of the uh, Counter Drug Battalion. The second uh, were a limited number of conscripts who changed their status and became professional soldiers and accepted a longer term of service. And I know you're aware, sir, there are two pay scales in the Colombian military. The professional soldier is paid at one level and the conscript at another. Uh, so those conscripts who volunteered to join the CD Battalion and to become professional soldiers then immediately went to the higher pay level. Uh, education uh, in and of itself, with the exception of one category of soldiers, isn't treated quite the same in Colombia as uh, it is in the United States. Uh, to my knowledge, sir, there is uh, really no cri specific criteria on enlistment for high school graduates uh, in the Colombian Army. The exception are the bacheloretes. Can I ask you a follow-up question to that? My understanding is, is that if you have a high school degree, you can't be sent to a combat zone without your approval. These are the bachelorists, sir. Uh, somewhere between 35 and 40,000, depending on who you talk about, who, based on their education level, uh, sign a contract, but they're immediately exempted from combat duties. Uh, you may recall, sir, during one of our first meetings when uh, Minister Rodrigo Lloreda was still the Minister of Defense, that was really the cardinal vector in his Reform the Armed Forces uh, program. He wanted to do away with the bachilleros. Uh, Defense Minister Luis Ramirez, who has replaced uh, Minister uh, Lloreda, has continued on that track, and he is supported fully by General Tapias uh, and by General Mora, the commander of the Army. Uh, they are still uh, very much uh, committed to ending the bachelorette's program. Uh, what they contemplate, sir, is to reduce the overall in strength of the Army uh, not a one-for-one -one conversion of bachelorettes to professional soldiers, but something less than that. Uh, then whatever revenues are saved can be devoted to uh, modernization and to including uh, or to improving force capabilities. Thank you. Ms. Salazar, did you have anything to add? I, I really don't have any other comment to add except that what another area that we're, we're, we're looking at is almost in respond, in, in kind of responding some of your concern is that with any type of program like this, one of the things we look at is also trying to make sure that we developed the Colombians, in this case, Colombians' capability, to we try to train trainers who then would have the responsibility of being able to support the training capacity that this unit would have as some of these people are moving out just out of normal attrition. I mean, we have to expect that there's going to be movement of these people. So that's also an important aspect of, of, some, of the program. Mr. Ledwith, I, I, um, we're pleased that we finally have started some of the extradition processes, which has been bogged down for a long time in Colombia. What would you say were the critical things that moved that forward? I, I think the process is, is going forward at, at a, an appropriate rate right now. We have some 30, well, we have some 40 extradition requests pending with the government of Colombia. The government of Colombia has been dealing with them in a very forthright nature. We've seen the first Colombian citizen extradited here some time ago. Jaime Lara Nausa was brought here to face heroin trafficking charges in New York. So I think we're proceeding in the appropriate direction at this time, sir. I think we also need to allow the judicial process to work its way through the Colombian system while we do this. The, uh, if I could make one other uh, brief comment, and uh, General Wilhelm, if you want to comment, uh, invite you to do so that uh, General McCaffrey had made a statement, uh, in fact, he made it multiple times, that, uh, which I uh, agree with in fundamental principle, that we need to respect the Colombian government 
systems and that as we debate the national police and the defense department we need to respect the fact that they would like to build up the defense department there's no question that there are there are both personal and political rivalries inside Colombia how to approach this but um, I think it's important that we don't overstate that as we kind of get into this package because the fact is is that I'm very proud from the time I talk to you now I'm proud of how you've behaved and thrown yourself into this job to try to help Colombia build up their military and try to save this country because if we can save it we have some hope of licking the drug problem here if we lose it we're in deep trouble and you understood firsthand that you were gonna go down there and help them but the truth is is as we develop the package and as you have told me personally as did General Clark and General McCaffrey before that their military is is pretty backwards and for they're developing that, but I'm saying as far as what they need and how to attack this. Command and control is a word that we've talked about, and they're different systems. Mm -hmm. The important variable is that is, is the truth is, in talking with their government, and I fully support trying to get the maximum package mm -hmm. we can, is they depend a lot on our input as to what that package was. And for us to act like the mix of the package was only their choice rather than us inputting, it was a mix and that we can continue to mix it. Furthermore, the Europeans have chosen in their package not to help the military. They want to do all the alternative development stuff. So that means our package is skewed towards the, the military side. And I also heard General McCaffrey say that the Colombian government wants to take care of the national police, putting us, putting the dollars into the military. It's nice that they want Blackhawks. I mean, I'm a supporter of Blackhawks too. But the truth is, and I, I want to make that clear, that we want to figure out uh, too, and have an input into the mix. And we have a right as the United States government, since we're representing taxpayers and their dollars, to input into that mix too. And while we need to be sensitive to their internal structures and not say build up the national police solely when they're asking for defense, it doesn't mean that we don't have some discretion in our package to talk about that, nor does it mean that their package was solely developed by them without input from our defense department, our state department, and others and I, I felt it was important to say that for the record And if I've made any misstatements in that or any clarifications that you want to uh, add you can do so uh, Congressman Sutter I, I think that's a good and very valid statement uh, I try to get out of the mode of talking about uh, their package uh, and the package that we developed and talk about our package uh, more of a consultative approach to what Columbia's needs are uh, sir, it's true that the performance of their armed forces left a great deal to be desired, certainly uh, from about mid-1998 back to about 1995 or thereabouts. I probably wouldn't say they were backwards. Uh, they suffered a real loss of credibility. Uh, part of it was their own doing. Uh, a lot of it was due to the human rights violations, which Mrs. Schakowsky was talking about, which plagued the armed forces. And indeed, in 1993, the armed forces were really charged with about 53% of the human rights violations. Uh, today, the breakout is about 70% to the paramilitaries, about 25% plus to the guerrillas, and somewhere between 3 and 5% to the military, which is a way of saying they cleaned up their act. Uh, they're proud of that. Uh, but I would tell you, if Fernando Tapias, the commander of the armed forces, were uh, sitting here, he would contradict me. He would say, no, I'm not proud of that. 3% is 3% too many. I've known him for a long time, and I think he really means that. Uh, sir, your other statement about the relationship between the military and the national police, I think, does deserve perhaps a little bit broader airing. Uh, as we've gone through the process of developing this expanded assistance package, I, for one, have never suggested that one thin dime be uh, diverted from the support to the national police. There are a lot of admirers of General Jose Russo Serrano in this room, and I'm one of them. Uh, I believe that we should continue to make an investment in a blue-chip stock which the Colombian National Police have been. My contention, and the one we talked about at the very outset, sir, was that I was afraid that Colombia's security forces had gotten out of balance. The Colombian National Police had a capability at this level, the armed forces at this level, and to really win the struggle they're in, I felt they needed to be brought into balance. I really believe that that's what the supplemental, as it's currently framed, uh, will do or start to do. 
Uh, you know, I've really pushed with both General Serrano and General Tapias that this really should not be competitive. They should seek to be complementary one to the other. They're classmates. Uh, personally, they get along well, and I think they have their two institutions moving on a positive and productive track. The, um, I thank the chairman. Thank you. Um, just to, to wind up, a couple of uh, questions we'll go through here and see if anyone has any remaining. Um, Mr. Ledwith, uh, it's been testified that 75 percent approximately of the heroin coming into the United States, according to your signature analysis, comes from Colombia. Is that correct? As, as much as. It, it, it as much as. And what percentage of uh, cocaine today? 60, 70 percent probably? At the very least, sir. At the very least. So this doesn't appear to be rocket scientists to see where the stuff is coming from that's ending up in our streets. Um, we also heard testimony uh, from the, the drug czar and uh, from our summit last week that 75 percent of the heroin in the world is produced in Afghanistan to pretty much narrow down the, the hard narcotics uh, sources. Um, with that in mind, uh, Mr. Romero, uh, the only – now, this, this, this war is a little bit like Jello. You push it down one place and it pops up another. Is there anything in the uh, administration's plan to support the U.N. anti-narcotics effort? Uh, I can't really speak to that effort. Is there I, I anything do know that there is there – is a normal budget now You have money in that. there for Peru and for Bolivia. Yes. We know it might pop up back there, and we've no. also seen, since the surveillance is down, coca production is slightly up, which gen the general told me about uh, when I was in Miami and uh, during the holidays. So we know when we let, let up, it pops up. But there's nothing in there for the U.N., right? Now, we don't have any program in the U.N. The only thing uh, – I'm sorry, we don't have any program in Afghanistan. Only the UN program that we support through uh, the uh, UN ONDCP, Office of Drug Control Policy, supports that effort. Now, I don't think we can pass this package without supporting that UN effort. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty far to the conservative side, uh, but we just conducted that seminar with our uh, UN uh, partners, our, our European Union partners. <coughs> And we know that uh, where 75 percent of the supply is coming from in the entire world and 75 percent of it coming into the United States, we cannot pass this package, Mr. Romero and others in the administration, without some funds, uh, not only for Peru and Bolivia. 100 percent of the cocaine is produced in those three countries, right? Okay. And there's not too many places that have the altitude or capability or uh, uh, of, of production. So. Uh, if I might just yes. uh, just, just uh, add, uh, I'm I'm happy to tell you that there is money How for, much? for UNDP uh, in the existing budget. I do know that they are. Oh, no, I'm talking about in, in the, the supplemental. Package. In the supplemental. I do know that they're working the micro uh, herbicide issue in Colombia. But well, we don't, don't even want to get into that because that which we know we can use chemical and other treatment to do away with the drugs, and the administration has a horrible record on that which I, I think the money's still sitting there. I don't think they've done a darn thing yet. But to answer but, your question on the we, regional, we, we there need is a lot of regional money in this package. That's going to pop up, up and they'll get it from someplace else. So we need to support that effort. Uh, finally, I read with dismay that they're putting a price tag, the Mexican traffickers on our border agents. Uh, DEA, what can, what can we uh, – this $200,000 price tag or something was reported in the media on our border agents. Uh, if they touch a hair on our d our border agents, what do we have in, uh, uh, in store for them as far as U.S. retaliation? Well, clearly there is intelligence. Do we have a price tag on these guys, the drug traffickers? Well, there certainly is a reward program, but we – 
We are, are keenly aware of the risk that our, the brave men and women of all of law enforcement face working overseas and along, and along the border. We're, we're concerned about developing intelligence that there are traffickers putting prices on the heads of law enforcement officials along but the border. Is that going to be a priority of yours? And will we, can we also pay rewards to get these guys if they go after our guys? Sir, the, the safety of the men and women working for DEA and in all in law enforcement, the military is of paramount issue to us. That would be our first priority, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mag I just have one uh, final question to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, Ms. Salazar. In your uh, final page of your testimony, you again reiterate the uh, departmental policy regarding deployment of U.S. military personnel in counter-drug missions. And you state that uh, the uh, plan that we're debating here today will not require any change in policy because the existing policy will carry over. And you said the supplemental does not require a change in U.S. policy. Is there a risk to U.S. personnel providing counter-drug support? You responded, yes, there is. And the final question, is the risk increased as a result of the programs being enhanced by the supplemental? And your answer was no. Could you explain that no answer? Yeah, I, I guess in part the reason for that comment was twofold. On the one hand, um, and, and I guess... Uh, you know, we have one very clear example that affect us, uh, affected us in the last eight months. We, uh, any U.S. or anyone who's involved in counter-narcotics um, activities and law enforcement activities, is, it's a very dangerous business. Uh, and, but with that said, we have had programs in Colombia for the last 10 years, and we have done, I believe, a very effective job in making sure that the force protection issues of those, uh, not only of DOD personnel, but also of the law enforcement uh, personnel and the embassy personnel that's down there are adequately uh, supported and responded to. Now, I, the reason why I made that statement is because, as, as General Wilhelm had stated, we don't foresee an increased number of our footprint in Colombia. So in so much that we continue to provide and enhance our current programs, which is what the supplemental does, we don't foresee any change in policy, uh, although we will continue to be very, very uh, concerned and make sure that we support the, the, uh, the DOD personnel that is in Colombia at this point. I know, General Wilhelm, the issue of force protection has been a, a prime concern to you. As uh, Mr. Ledwith stated, the uh, position of the Department of Defense is essentially identical with that of the Department of Justice. There is no higher priority than the protection of our people on the ground. Uh, Congresswoman Mink, I was in uh, Tres Esquinas last week, uh, and in fact I spent a good portion of my time there really uh, walking the ground and going over each and every element of the force protection plan. Uh, we are creating a critical mass, uh, I will tell you that. Uh, the facilities are growing. We're going to be moving aircraft in there. Uh, by doing that, are we creating a target as a military person? I would tell you, yes, we are. Uh, to compensate for the development of that target, we really need to improve the status of the physical measures and the procedural measures to secure the force. Uh, we won't allow the U.S. presence to get out of control, uh, but there are other issues. Uh, it's our credibility and the support that we've provided to Colombia. I know uh, Pete Romero remembers well a couple of disastrous attacks in El Salvador, which really uh, undermine the confidence in what we're doing. Uh, we cannot and will not let that happen in Colombia. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, where are, the, where are the, the Blackhawks going to go, and uh, to what units and services will those be uh, given, to, or, or are we leaving that up to the Colombians? Oh, no, sir. Uh, again, this has been a consultative thing. Sir, there are an awful lot of Blackhawks here. Uh, let me see if I can walk real quickly through uh, the military array of airplanes, just so that we're all proceeding from a common baseline. Uh, when this uh, whole enterprise started, uh, the Army had seven Blackhawks, the Air Force had 18. Uh, recently, uh, the, Columbia, the Colombians themselves executed the un 
used portion of a former f m s case and got five additional black hawks which went to the air force those airplanes are being armed for armed escort missions the colombians on their own hook with their own financing are buying fourteen airplanes blackhawks which are to be delivered during the year two thousand during this calendar year sikorsky says they can do that seven of those airplanes will go to the air force to be armed as escorts seven will go to the army uh, as troop transports then the supplemental package of thirty additional blackhawks which uh... our last liaison with sikorsky said fourteen months after funds are committed we will start a delivery stream initially with one aircraft and then their planning estimate was two aircraft per month thereafter so they could fill out the buy by the early part of the year two thousand and two uh, it's uh, as general mccaffrey stated sir i think uh, we can sort of confuse ourselves a little bit uh... when we get overly focused on the airplane it may not be the long pole in the tent the air crew may be the long pole in the tent and i do want to make one thing clear uh, about a progression of aviation capabilities we have eighteen uh... one ends twin engine hueys on the ground right now and we plan to provide fifteen more next year for a total of thirty three those are interim aircraft when the thirty blackhawks are delivered the uh one ends will be removed from the inventory those are state department assets i suspect they'll come back to i and l our intent then is to transition the pilots that we're training from the for the uh one ends to the blackhawks transition training is a lot different from starting from scratch uh... so we will use the services of the spanish helicopter battalion at fort rucker alabama which does train on the Black Hawk helicopter, and it really won't take 18 months to train a pilot. If he can, in fact, fly a UH-1N, a much shorter period will be required uh, to transition him uh, to the Black Hawk. So but this thing may not be as long as it sounded. Eventually, uh, Black Hawks will be uh, in both the Air Force and the Army inventories. That is correct, sir, and the National Police. Uh, how many will be going to the CNP? Sir, uh, I'd have to defer to state on that. Our target for the armed forces is 44. Let me round that one out. Uh, Pete. Uh, Pardon? I'm told six. Okay. Is there any hesitancy in, in, uh, in these Blackhawks going to the, the, the three services, in effect, the, the Army, the Air Force, and the National Police in, in some mix? I mean, State in, in a different mix than, than, than what we've just told you? Well, no, either that mix or, or, or some permutation of it. Um, I think that this is predicated on planning counter-narcotics battalions and that sort of thing, and I'm not, uh, I'm not net enough of an expert to tell you that there's more here, there should be or could be more here. No, I'm just talking there. from a policy standpoint. From a policy standpoint, there are no. Okay. I would agree with that, sir. I think this uh, correctly reflects aviation roles and missions as they're viewed in the Colombian uh, Armed Forces. Transport is an Army mission, uh, armed support is an Air Force mission, and then, of course, the CNP uh, operates in the law enforcement role. But from a policy standpoint for us, I don't see any uh, implications. Uh, we, we heard earlier, and we've heard a lot, General, about the uh, training that the Colombian Army uh, has received and is receiving. I presume that we can all agree that, there, that we want to see the services down there, particularly the Army and the CNP, uh, operate jointly yes, uh, and understand each other and have joint missions and so forth. Why then uh, haven't the, uh, uh, or hasn't the CNP received the same training that we're providing to the Army? Wouldn't it be in our best interest to make sure that they're both on the same wavelength and on the same level? Uh, sir, the answer to that question is, is uh a sort of a yes and no answer. We trained the first counter drug battalion in three phases. Uh, the first phase was one of their uh, maneuver companies and their specialty platoons, reconnaissance, uh, medical, and uh, mortar. Uh, their indirect fire capability. The second phase was the remaining two maneuver companies uh, and the headquarters. The third phase was an integration phase. And during that phase, the Colombian National Police did provide policemen uh, from the counter-narcotics units who did train uh, with the 1st Battalion. 
quite frankly sir the cops didn't need the training in the first two phases a lot of that was individual training and basic field craft required by the soldiers uh, the policemen already had their specialty training, so I agreed with the Colombians, with General Serrano and General Tapias, that the right time for integration was phase three. Uh, Congressman Mike has mentioned, uh, though it's been quiet uh, on purpose, we didn't ballyhoo this, the 1st Battalion has been out of garrison twice now, a single company operation, a two company operation, in each case with Colombian National Police participation. They've taken down labs, they've identified transit points, they've captured base precursor chemicals, and they've plotted uh, active uh, coca fields, uh, which are now targeted for eradication. So quietly, uh, they got out of garrison. It was a shakedown cruise of sorts, but it was real world operations. The target folders that uh, they were using were developed in the Colombian Joint Intelligence Center by a combination of soldiers and policemen. Okay, so from both then an operational standpoint as well as I presume, and this is basically to all of you, from a policy standpoint, uh, there will be appropriate training provided so that both the, the Army and the CNP uh, receive adequate, adequate training and for joint operations, which we, we obviously encourage, they will be on the same level eventually. Absolutely, sir, and uh, really that is one of the real uh, cardinal uh, principles in the training we're conducting. We want these forces to be entirely interoperable. We've got a couple of warts right when, now. When you, say, when you say we, that means DOD and state and DEA, everybody's DOD, on the same DOD, state, way. DEA, okay. justice, and importantly, the Colombian Armed Forces and the Colombian National Police. I mentioned we got a couple potholes to fill in. We ran into some problems with communications interoperability and we had dissimilar families of radios that had legacy systems that the police had and that the army had. We're bringing that together now, sir, and we'll solve that very soon. They'll be using the Tataran system that's been uh, bought from Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Souter. Any final questions? <clears throat> yes, I, I had a couple. Mr. Ledwith, um, earlier, uh, General McCaffrey, and uh, in general, it kind of seems to be a, a pitch right now that we found all this new information about the amount of cocaine coming out of, of Colombia and that uh, we've revised our past statistics uh, as amount of cocaine. Was the DEA surprised? No, sir. So you kind of felt that this problem had been building for the last few years? Yes, sir. Um, the reason I wondered is because every time I had gone down to Colombia, I had heard that it had been transferring and both the DEA and others had been telling us. And I wonder, um, uh, uh, do you have any, want to make any public comments for the record as to why you feel that all of a sudden we're having this big surprise? Also, uh, quite honestly, what, what needed to be done was the scientific work to back up the theory. There was a theory prevalent, as, as you're probably well aware of, that the math simply didn't work uh, on the amount of seizures versus the availability. Uh, this raised certain concerns. We energized a process by which we try to evaluate this. And the basis for it is, is locked in scientific evidence that, in essence, that we conduct similar laboratory operations and we utilize local methods in local practices and make cocaine. Uh, from this, we make determinations as to the amount of cocaine that can be produced from specific crops, specific areas, utilizing certain chemicals and processes that are currently available. And, and this process is, is still underway so that the final scientific evidence uh, will not come out till April or May. But clearly the, the initial indications are that the, the Colombians have adapted certain methods to the production of cocaine that allow them to exceed the, the production potential that had been previously uh, decided on. I thank you. I have a... Uh a theory as well, and and my theory is this: that not General McCaffrey, not General Wilhelm, or anybody his predecessors at Southcom, or for that matter, in anti narcotics at the State Department. But the theory was is that the administration was focused on other parts of the world. We've had kids dying in Indiana because of stuff coming from Colombia for a long time, and it wasn't too hard for our local law enforcement to figure out on the street that we were getting increased Colombian uh, heroin and increased Colombian cocaine. 
that the question is, is if we have thousands of Americans dying because of drug abuse, why wasn't, weren't these scientific methods used earlier? Unless there was an overarching concern, which is what I believe has happened to our war on narcotics, about the Balkans, uh, as we went with, with now Speaker Hastert over into to, uh, the uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Operation Southern Watch and Northern Watch, we heard from the commanders there that they don't believe they need to be spending that many dollars on what they're doing, that they, they know whenever Iraq goes up in the air and they know when they come down and when we go up that we're spending millions and even billions of dollars annually over there and in the Balkans diverting from this and we wanted to kind of look the other way and that now all of a sudden we realize we're about to potentially lose Colombia and everybody's focusing and it's time to get our research together. I'm glad everybody's on board but pardon some of us for being a little skeptical about not about the people who've been involved in it but about the overarching priority. Now um, uh, Ambassador Romero, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, one is, is that I think um, there, and I want to make it clear, I think General Serrano and the Colombian National Police are heroes. I have, I think it is the right approach, what they're taking in the, in the military, the defense minister and others, and I support that. But I also want to take as much as possible at face value the statements that say we're not going to undermine what indeed are the units that are already vetted, that have had a track record, that have public support. General Serrano's book right now in the drug wars, the number one book in Colombia, outselling uh, Marquez and any other author there. We have a national hero. We have a process. But my understanding is, is that on Friday we were told there'll be no Buffalo transport plans for the CMP because the State Department didn't feel it was necessary, even though it was in our report language, that 15, not 25 Super Hueys, we appropriated for 25 and only 15 are going, and that our latest reports show that six of the 25 CNP pilot school slots went to the Army. Now, why wouldn't we increase the number of slots? Why would we take CMP slots? And I wondered, in fact, to some degree, this does seem like a zero-sum game, that I'm, I'm for building up the defense ministry efforts on anti-narcotics, but not if we can't get what even we've already said we wanted to get to CMP, and now pilot school slots are taken. Congressman Sauter, I'm not responsible for running the operations on our counter-narcotics program down in, uh, in, uh, in Colombia, and I think uh, it's unfortunate that Randy Beers, who is in Colombia today, is not here to answer that question. Uh, but I will certainly take it back to him. Let me just mention one thing, and that is that we, even before any idea of a supplemental or anything came to mind, uh, had been, have been pushing the uh, uh, military and the police to collaborate. Uh, this is something that, that uh, Charlie Wilhelm has been working on for a couple of years. We at State mention it every time we're there. Um, there's been good progress, but not enough. There needs to be a whole lot more. They need to put, us, put aside their rivalries and their traditions and that sort of thing and work together. And hopefully under this plan, Columbia, uh, they will. One last thing, and that is that uh, um, you can only do what the Colombian government is ready to accept. And uh, I think before June of uh, this past year, uh, the Colombian government was not ready to accept that they, that they needed to, to, to make a bold move and to integrate their efforts and integrate their forces and reach out to the international community and to do a comprehensive integrated plan like they've put together uh, and, and like we support. Finally, they've come around to that and uh, you know, better late than never. If the chairman, if I can ask one more one question, question. Um, that uh, funny you should bring that up because that was the other question that I wanted to ask you. Um, <clears throat> in your, and I apologize for missing your formal statement. All I have here in front of me is the draft statement, which you may have had some changes. But you refer to <clears throat> Colombia must reestablish its authority over narcotics producing sanctuaries. In your written testimony, you don't mention the FARC per se. Partly what President Pastrana has done, in my opinion, is he's followed Christ's admonition. He's, admonition. he's turned his cheek, and he's turned his cheek, and he's negotiated with the FARC, and he's negotiated the FARC. Do you believe it's possible to reestablish its authority over narcotics-producing sanctuaries without defeating the FARC in those areas? Um, well, I would hope that at some point in time the FARC would see the writing on the wall and decide that this is the best time to negotiate. Uh, before the tide starts to turn and the government starts to reestablish a presence or in many cases establish for the first time a presence in many of these areas. Um, that I think is the hope of, uh, of President Pastrana and the Colombian people but it remains to be seen. Do you believe if they don't see the light they should be defeated? Are they inextricably intertwined with the narcotics protection? 
Uh, I think that that provides about 50 percent of their financing. The other 50 percent comes from kidnapping and extortion and, uh, uh, and that sort of, uh, sort of thing, war taxes that they exert uh, even on Venezuelans uh, who, who happen to live on the, on the Venezuelan side of the border. Uh, I think that the program is designed to take away primary sources of income at the same time that we cut, we cut back not only on production but also put a lot of emphasis, we haven't really discussed this, on, on, on interdiction. Uh, and I think if all of those pieces work with regaining the, the control of, uh, uh, of their territory, not just militarily but using the police, using the civilian entities to come in behind them, I think it can work. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. This is a long-term commitment. So you think it's to some degree more of a lobbying effort than a military effort to defeat them? To defeat them militarily uh, would require um, uh, uh, probably force structures and, and mobility and all of the things that we're talking about and probably several years to do. You, so do you disagree that only 3 percent of the public support the FARC? Uh, I agree with that. I don't think there's any more. I think 3 percent is probably exaggerated. But you're talking about a land mass that they operate in that is huge. Uh, with no infrastructure, it's not like you can get in a cop car, drive down the street and find the culprits. These are people whose main way of transportation is through river, river networks and who are in a, in a, in a land mass that is absolutely huge. With I thank the, I very, think, very yeah, I th gentleman. And, uh, I, th I want to thank him for his comments. And I also want to say that I don't believe there's anybody more genuinely committed to try and negotiate than President Pastrana. And it hasn't been working very well, and we need to show some force. Well, uh, I have uh, one final question. Mr. Gilman has left, but he asked uh, if I could ask this to Ambassador Romero. Could you please tell this uh, uh, subcommittee if uh, non-drug-related offenses are covered by the United States extradition treaty with Colombia? For example, is murder and kidnapping included in the treaty as extraditable offenses? Could you comment on this? I'd have to go back and look at the extradition you... treaty. It's fairly new. But I do know in the case of this, uh, um, in the latest case uh, of uh, statements made by President Pastrana, I think there is a, a, a clause in the Colombian mm -hmm. Constitution which uh, prohibits extradition of Colombian nationals for crimes committed in Colombia. Well, uh, now I don't I know whether this. I have a copy of the extradition uh, treaty and. Uh, murder, uh, assault with intent to commit murder is included in that. Uh, but uh, I wish you would elaborate for the record and uh, we'll provide without uh, objection a copy of this uh, provided by Mr. Gilman into the record and uh, we'll wait for your response. I thank the uh, panel. This is an uh, extremely important topic. Uh, you all play key roles. and. Uh, making certain that to whatever package is approved by Congress uh, is effective and does uh, what we intend. As you see, there's some difference of opinion, but I think everybody's trying to get to the same uh, point. Um, and uh, we thank you for your participation. Again, Mr. Barr. Just, uh, uh, I have no more questions for the panel. I know they've been very patient, and uh, uh, so have you. Uh, could I ask, I still have some concerns over the uh, what seems to be a, a strong preference for training for the military as opposed to the CNP uh, based on some information w that we've received. Could we do some follow-up letters uh, to the witnesses perhaps? Absolutely. And I also anticipate not next week but the week after to ask or subpoena uh, Mr. Pickering and Mr. Uh, Beers and a, wit White. and a witness from the uh, minority, Mr. Uh, former Ambassador Robert White to be appear before the subcommittee so we can get firsthand uh, information about uh, what's going on there and additional, uh, additional uh, background that you're requesting. Thank you. Uh, I thank each of you for, again, your participation and uh, working with this panel. <coughs> you're excused. Check our webpage for future air times for this hearing, www.cspan.org. Once there, you can watch some events in their entirety or purchase copies of our programs.